All right, good morning. I am Christine Platt, Managing Director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University. And I have the honor of welcoming you to our first Empowering Educators convening. Over 12,000 educators, teaching professionals, librarians, and parents from around the world are joining us for this exciting and timely event. And I wanna give a special welcome to the Maryland School for the Deaf. I am so happy that you're here. I'm learning, and that's what we're all here to do today, to learn. Today, you'll hear from award-winning educators like Liz Kleinrock, visionaries like Julie Williams, founder of Project 2043, AU's Dean of the School of Education, Dr. Cheryl Hoka McCoy, and of course, our keynote speaker, National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, Jason Reynolds. And good morning to you. My name is Malini Ranganathan, and I am Interim Faculty Director of AU's Anti-Racism Center. Today's convening was created for you and designed to do just what our title states, to empower educators with the resources and inspiration to help make their learning environments more equitable and intentionally anti-racist. As educators head back to their virtual and or socially distanced schools this fall, they must confront and teach to the historical legacies and racist structures that led up to this political moment and do so in a way that demonstrates rigorous, critical, and inclusive pedagogy. It is our hope that today's convening will help guide you in this important work. Today's event is made possible by Pizza Hut and First Book. We are so grateful for your sponsorship. I'd now like to introduce Shaquan Lewis and Kyle Zimmer. Shaquan is the Chief Equity Officer for Pizza Hut, and Kyle is the President, CEO, and Co-Founder of First Book. Thank you both so much for supporting this event and for joining us today. Happy to be here. Thank you. So Christine, uh, Molly, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Let me say at the outset, um, as Pizza Hut, we are so proud to support this work. We're proud to support educators and the folks that will get a chance to benefit from it. And we're proud to do it in this American moment and in this global moment. And we know it's not a new moment, but there's something unique happening as more scales fall from more eyes and more people are activated and prepared to engage this work in the, in, through the lens of equity. And I'll just say that this is personal to me. I'm a Book It kid and, and some of my fondest memories are, yeah, Book It. I don't know if you guys can see that. Some of my fondest, <laughs> memories, some of my fondest memories literally are uh, growing up in Watauga, Texas and my mom taking me to the Pizza Hut on Roof Snow with my book it certificate and sliding that thing across like it was a million dollar bill and getting some pizza back um, because reading was making something like that possible for me. Now, I'm well into my 30s, so that lets you know that Pizza Hut is not new to this space. We've been there. And in fact, for the last three years, we've been working with kids to inspire a passion for reading. We've been working with educators to connect that to the classroom. And um, we continue to be committed to leaning in and rounding up in that way. Now, as we look at the space that we're in right now, we know that Pizza Hut has a unique space on the landscape, and we own that. We don't run from it, and we believe that we can help create a more vibrant community, a more vibrant country, a more vibrant world um, by chasing equity, by chasing equity. So hard to achieve, but the chase, there's value and there's justice in that, and we do it with intentionality, we do it with authenticity, and we do it with, with humility. And along the way, we, we embrace social justice and many of the topics we'll talk about today. And we'll stand on the principles and the platform of anti-racism. And we have this thesis that when market actors lead with moral clarity, it can make a difference in this world. And we want to occupy that space alongside folks on this call to see communities change and see cities change and see maybe even countries change. So today we're marking a new chapter in our deep commitment to literacy. And we're doing work that sits right at the intersection of equity and education. And we couldn't be prouder to do it in this space with American University, but also with a phenomenal partner uh, like First Book. So look, First Book cares about your kids, our kids. Uh, First Book cares about the issues that keep educators up at night. And in fact, when you think about what I think is the most important profession, if you are up at night, we should all be up at night. And this partnership is about leaning into that and meeting you where you are and building 
a world that helps you build the world that we need to have to live and to grow. And so we're culminating really from our perspective a, about a year of work towards this end. And this idea of bringing together world-class experts that you'll get a chance to hear from today to bring solutions and resources and tools to people like you who are taking on our toughest issues, it's a powerful thing. And what we're hoping we get a chance to do is to really start answering one of the most important questions of our time. How do we make racial equity real in the classroom? How do we make racial equity real in the spaces where we educate the minds that will lead us tomorrow who own our future? Part of the answer is we do it together. Part of the answer is we do it with folks that are brave enough to lead us. And we're really excited as Pizza Hut to be a part of that fabric and that tapestry that's gonna make us a richer, uh, a brighter and a more promising country. So I turn it over to Kyle and I'm excited to see what we've got going on for the rest of the day. Kyle. Thanks, Shaquan. I, uh, you know, I, I'm so thrilled to be here today because we are all aware that across our nation, we're on this critical journey together to better understand and to undo systemic racism. And to support this journey, as you've mentioned, First Book and Pizza Hut have joined together to launch this unprecedented partnership to empower educators and to reach the children they serve. This is critically important. While it is gonna take all of us to create a new anti-racist culture, our educators have a unique perspective and a unique power because it is our educators who are working with our children every day. They work to recognize and celebrate every student's individual gifts and to create supportive environments where every single student has the opportunity to realize their potential. It is also here in our classrooms and programs where children are looking to understand what they're seeing and experiencing in their communities, in their neighborhoods, and in their homes. So we're delighted to welcome all of you to today's convening, which will elevate discussions around teaching humanity, the importance of anti-racist teaching, and practical tools for educators. And this is just the beginning. And this is the part I'm so excited about because today's Empowering Educators session serves as the launch pad for a series of educator resources that First Book and Pizza Hut are rolling out today. These resources were developed in response to input from educators in the First Book network, and our network now numbers more than 475,000 members. And those are educators working with kids in need, ages zero to 18, in schools and programs all across this country. We learned about this need by talking to and listening to our network of educators. In fact, in a survey earlier this year, 66% of respondents said that they would like to more proactively engage their students in conversations about race. 76% told us that they needed new tools to support effective age appropriate conversations about race. So in listening to those, those statements from our own educators, educator network, we realized that to address those needs, we needed to take big strong steps. So we developed the Empowering Educator Resources, along with a series of curated books, which will be available on the First Book Marketplace, which you can find at fbmarketplace.org. The First Book Marketplace is, a, is specifically designed to provide educators serving children in need with free and low cost, high quality books, basic needs items, digital learning resources, research-based tools, and a variety of other critical resources. In addition to the Empowering Educators resources and curated books, we're also going to be rolling out additional supports in the coming weeks and months ahead. So watch this space. None of this would be possible without the support and leadership 
and really vision of Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut has long been a champion of literacy and educational opportunity through their Book It program. You've just seen the Book It spokesman. <laughs> and, and through their work as the Literacy Project. These are initiatives working at the local level in communities across the country to bring the power of books and reading to millions and millions of children. So when we came to Pizza Hut's leadership about the educators' need for tools to have real conversations about race during this time, this is what Pizza Hut said. We are in. I have never been so grateful for such a strong and visionary response. It really is extraordinary. So we're also grateful for the opportunity to work with thought leaders and subject matter experts from American University and for the generosity of experience and perspective that will be shared by award-winning teacher Liz Kleinrock and award-winning author Jason Reynolds. This is one powerhouse panel. So as we prepare for whatever it is that back to school will look like this year, today's conversation is just what we need. Uplifting us with inspiring and enlightening insights and new resources to use as we work together in our communities to realize the potential of all children. We are so honored to work with Pizza Hut and the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center on this important initiative. Thank you all so much for committing to this important and profoundly hopeful work. So I think it's back to you, Christine. Yes, thank you so much, Kyle. And thank you, Shaquan. Also a Book It Kid here, just want to throw that out there. Um, now, before we begin, a few ground rules. This event is happening via Zoom webinar and YouTube live stream, which means that our audience's video and audio is automatically turned off. Audience members in Zoom can interact with the panelists via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Those participating in YouTube can submit questions via the survey link located in the YouTube event description. Live captioning will be available at the bottom of your screen throughout the event. For those who are participating in the Zoom webinar platform, you can access this service by clicking on the CC closed caption icon in your toolbar. For those who are participating on YouTube, it is automatic. And for those who would benefit from ASL interpretation, this service will be available in gallery view throughout the entire event. We have several folks monitoring the chat room, including AUPD. So please know that anyone who engages in harassing and harmful language will be removed. And for everyone else who is here to learn and do the work, please use the chat room to ask those questions that you have for the panelists. Of course, we won't be able to answer every question, so please thumbs up those that you want answered and we'll do our best to ensure that the panelists answer those questions first. Also, if you see a question that you can answer, please feel free to jump in and assist your fellow teaching professionals and parents. Also, if you are live posting about this event, which we hope you are, please use the hashtag Pound EE convening on your social networks. And now, without further ado, let's get this convening started. Do we have Julie and Liz here with us? I'm here. Thank you so much. Yes, wonderful, you. wonderful. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank You're you so, so much. It's incredible to be included with this group of educators and folks. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Can you all believe that we have been working on the Empowering Educators series for almost an entire year? <laughs> and the day is finally here. I, I mean, I am so excited that we're finally able 
to talk about and share the resources that we've created for educators. Um, but first, I'd love for you both to tell the audience a little bit about yourselves and, um, and your work. And we'll start with you first, Julie. Sure. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Williams. I'm the founder of Project 2043. And we work to educate the public about the upcoming demographic shift in the US population. I've been in education for about 15 years. So starting out uh, setting up free tutoring programs in New York City to eventually co-founding an elementary school in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, currently, I serve as a senior advisor to First Book on educator resources and the Empowering Educator series that we're launching today is just one example of the type of support and advice I offer to First Book. Wonderful. Liz? Hey all, uh, my name is Liz Kleinrock. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a classroom educator at heart. I have taught first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grades, and this coming year we'll be teaching sixth grade ELA here in DC. Um, I'm actually in the middle of PD right now, so thank you very much to my admin if they're watching for letting me take the time to do this today. Um, I started my teaching career in California and Oakland and then moved to Los Angeles um, and have also done work with Teaching Tolerance. I won their award for excellence in teaching in 2018. I also sit on their advisory board and I'm currently working on my first book, um, which is about this topic that we're about to get into. So thank you very much for having me today. You're welcome and congratulations. So, Julie, let's talk a bit more about how the Empowering Educator series came about. As Kyle mentioned, it was in response to a 2019 survey of First Book members, right? Can you tell the audience a little bit more about that? Sure. So, as Kyle mentioned, you know, First Book and Pizza Hut had been in conversation about how can we uh, support educators specifically on the topic of race. And so in addition to making brand new books available at incredibly low prices, uh, they wanted to do more. And so we, uh, in 2019, we had a series of focus groups uh, and a survey to actually go to educators and ask them specifically, where do you need support when it comes to having conversations about race? Where do you need help? Uh, what resources do you need? And really the response from that survey and those focus groups are the groundwork for what uh, has become the Empowering Educator Series. Wonderful. And so you serve as the senior, as senior advisor for First Book and, um, and um, the Empowering Educator Series. And I know that because I work with you very closely. Um, can you tell attendees, I guess, a little bit more about Pizza Hut and First Book's vision for the series? Yeah, so the vision for this series is really for it to be a comprehensive uh, set of resources for educators to help them have courageous conversations with students about race. Um, but we pushed it a little more. And so we know that it's not enough to just have a conversation. We want students to be able to do more. And so in the resources that we've created, uh, there is a guidebook, which we'll talk about today. Uh, there are, is a video series, which we designed so that educators would have models. They would be able to see what it looks like for experts and folks who have deep experience in this area to, uh, to model their, their techniques and learn more about them directly. Um, and then the last part of the, the series is an activity. And so we want to have something that's interactive. And so when I think about the vision for, for the series, it's really to help educators uh, who may be new to this work or who may have been in this work for a while, but you know, you're always looking for, for, for new resources and, and, and new, new insight um, to be able to move forward in a very effective way and feel empowered as they engage students in conversations about race and more. Yeah, I, I remember when you asked me to um, contribute to the Empowering Educator series, and I remember you sharing part of that vision. Um, it has since, it, it just keeps expanding because this work is so exciting. And uh, I remember saying, uh, we're going to need some help. <laughs> and uh, I put in a call to Britt Hawthorne, um, Tiffany Jewell, Con Cornelius Minor, um, Catherine Wigginton Green at Point Made Media, and of course you, Liz. Um, and Liz, I'm really curious to know why you said yes, aside from me begging, <laughs> of course. Why did you think it was so important and why were you so willing to um, contribute to the Empowering Educator series? I mean, I think, how could I not say yes to this? Um, <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> um, 
I think I, I reflect a lot on my experience as a student teacher. And so my mentor teacher, his name is Lawrence Tan. He teaches in Oakland um, and he actually won the Teaching Tolerance Award a couple of years before I did. Um, and I imagine going into his classroom as a novice teacher. And I remember the types of work that he was doing with his kids that was so deeply embedded with anti-bias, anti-racist um, pedagogy. Um, and he just had an incredible lens and he was able to infuse it into everything we did with students. Um, and I think a lot how lucky I was that this was like the first experience I had um, in a mentor teacher's classroom. Um, because when I encountered other educators who would say things like, you know, this work is too challenging, it can't be done. Um, I was able to say, actually, um, you know, I'm actually in a classroom where this is being done every single day. And mm -hmm. I knew it was possible before anyone could tell me that it was impossible to do. Um, I think it's super important because anti-bias and anti-racist work is very much a spectrum. And, you know, as educators, we know that good teachers differentiate for their students, but we also don't give ourselves that grace as learners ourselves in this work. Um, so really excited to participate and help um, folks um, with resources and tools and strategies that help them develop comfort and fluency in this work the same way we want to support our kids. Um, also, like I have made plenty of mistakes in this work. I consider myself an anti-bias, anti-racist educator in progress because it's a constant process of learning and unlearning. And so also hoping to share the things that I have learned through reflection and revision. Thank you, thank you. I know one of the biggest questions um, you know, that we hope to answer for educators is, what do I do, right? Like, what do I do? Um, and Julie, let's discuss this first resource in the Empowering Educators series, um, the guidebook, which is launching today. I'm so excited. Um, so Julie, one of the things I love most about the guidebook is how it's structured to encourage educators to begin with the inner work before jumping into doing the outer work, such as evaluating their classroom cultures or creating a learning framework, right? Can you share why that's so important? Why is starting with the inner work so important? Yeah, so, you know, when you are talking about race, especially when you're talking to students about race, it's incredibly important to take the time to reflect on your own experience with race before you do. Um, understanding the history of race, how our country got to be where it is, um, understanding your own socialization and so what experiences you had growing up or even present day that influence your perspective about race and even understanding uh, your biases and areas where you may hold a prejudice. All of these things contribute to how you show up. Yeah. Regarding race. So it's really important that educators take the time, reflect uh, on their own experience, on their own beliefs, and their own understanding first, before you just jump into a conversation uh, with students. Yeah, I think there's always this eagerness to get started, right? And so I love that the guidebook is structured in this way. Um, and for those who are curious, the inner work includes understanding the history, increasing one's personal awareness, and acknowledging personal bias and prejudice. And I had the honor of contributing to one of the first steps educators should take when beginning the work, which is understanding the history of race as a social construct and its lasting implications. Um, many of the educators who had an opportunity um, to preview the historical timeline, you know, noted how helpful it was, um, but that also many educators would probably find it a little challenging, right? Because it's so different um, from the history that we're often taught. Um, Julie, why do you think leading with history is so important? So when we lead with history, it gives us the grounding, right? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when we talk about race, sometimes people may think it's, it's really rooted in opinion, um, mm -hmm. and it's not. Race is, there are innumerable historical events that have led to what we are experiencing today. And so having that understanding, you know, in the guidebook, we start in 1419, right? And so we, we take people back from the beginning, um, back to, to a very early point in history so that they understand all of the contributions, and all of the things that were done, uh, the laws that were passed, the policies that were enacted that have influenced race and race relations um, within our country today. I think the other thing that's important about history is that we want students to understand the history so they understand how we got to be where we are, but yeah. we also want them to be able to understand how do we change where we are to get to a better place. 
And so in order to do that, we have to understand how we got here. And so when we talk about having conversations with students, it's understanding how we got to where we are, but also understanding how we can take steps, different steps to move forward. Yeah, I mean, that historical timeline, I remember we were thinking, oh, we can probably just do a condensed two page <laughs> historical timeline. Um, and I think it's just so um, just wild, really, to see how lengthy the timeline is, and it's still condensed, right. And so I really hope educators um, find that historical timeline helpful. And then let's talk about um, the outer work, which is part two of the guidebook, which is designed to help educators create their framework, evaluate their classroom culture, and structure their lesson plans. Liz, I think one of the sections that um, will really, really benefit educators is your section on how to develop inquiry-based lesson plans. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it's impacted your work? Sure. Um I love teaching with an inquiry-based perspective. Um, it's really grounded in student background knowledge and the things that they're bringing into the conversation and lesson, as well as what they're interested in pursuing. So you as a teacher actively have to decenter yourself. Um, you are not the person standing at the front of the classroom as the holder of all knowledge and information. You're really there as a facilitator. If students ask questions, and even if you don't know the, the answer to those questions, because most of the time you actually won't, um, which I know can be a really big perceived barrier that prevents folks from engaging in this work. But I do think there's immense power and students coming to you asking a question and you saying, you know, I actually don't know the answer to that. That's a really good question, though. I bet we can figure out the answer together. Like, let's do that mm -hmm. together as a partnership. Um, and I think it's also a really amazing way to humanize yourself to your, your students as well as you engage in this learning process together. Um, a question that I often get from other teachers is, you know, how do you prevent um, people from coming into your classroom and saying, you know, you're brainwashing kids, you're, you know, trying to project your political agenda on your students. But when students are the ones coming up with the questions that are guiding their own learning, it is a really incredible authentic learning experience. So if somebody were to come into my classroom and say, why are you projecting all of this onto your students, I can actually turn to our anchor charts, um, to the research questions that they've generated themselves and say, actually, these are the things that the kids are interested in. I'm just here to help facilitate their learning. Um, a really basic strategy that I know a lot of educators are familiar with is a KWL chart where students list things that they know or they think they know about a topic, then we generate what we want to know, and then we chart our learning together, and it becomes this really amazing collaborative way of learning. Nice, nice. And Liz, um, I know you wanted to share a little bit of guidance um, with educators about the importance of understanding and acknowledging their students' identities, um, because that is also a big part of the work and I think ties in so perfectly um, to the inquiry-based lesson plans. Um, so I think I'm going to let you share your screen and tell the audience a bit more about that. Okay. And a lot of what I'm going to show you is also building on the really important work that Julie just mentioned around identity. Okay. Okay. So um, the first thing is really important. This is my own identity map. Um, before digging into this work, um, making sure that you have a really solid understanding of who you are. Um, so these are my social identity markers. Um, and again, like this work is a constant process of learning and unlearning, and that also means learning and unlearning things about yourself. Um, so these are some of my identifiers, um, the things that I've reflected upon. Some of these are fixed, some of these have changed, some of these are visible, some of these are invisible, um, and some of these things hold more weight than others. So I thought a lot about the identity markers that are the most important to me in my own identity as an adult, um, but which are also the things that were really important to me as a student. Okay. And through that, I then thought about which of my identity markers were actually the most validated when I was a student. And as you can see mm. between these two, there isn't a lot of overlap there. So when yeah. I think about the way that I engage with my kids, there are things that I might see about them that I might think are important to them, but it's most important for me to learn that from my students themselves because they are the ones who are actually the experts on themselves and their own identities, backgrounds, and experiences. Um, and so what you'll see here is three different activities that I do with my students at the beginning and um, for some of them, the end of the year as well. Um, the top left picture you see, um, there's a paper bag um, where my students do bio bags. So on the outside of these bags, they write the things that are visible to them or are visible to others. So the things that if you don't know them, but you see them, the things that you might be able to assume about them. 
on the inside of these bags, the students write notes about the things that you would only be able to know about them once you get to know them, once you engage them in conversation or ask them questions. Um, and this is a really important way for me to understand the parts of my students' identities that are important to them and how I can validate them in class. Um, the middle picture is a one pager. So when we do um, work around identity and family, and again, like, um, it's really important to approach these activities from a trauma informed lens as well. Um, this is a one pager that one of my students did about his father and we looked into mm. his ancestry and his family history, but this is the way that he chose to represent his father and his family. Um, and finally, the last picture on the bottom right is a version of the identity map I just showed you, but as one of my students. Um, and I actually have students do these maps at the beginning and end of the year for them to show how they grow as individuals as well in the nine months that we're together in class. Um, and just to be, um, to be open about this, um, all three student examples were given, were, um, I'm permitted to show these with um, both student and family consent. So before getting into this, make sure that you have uh, FERPA guidelines and laws on your side as well. Thank you. That was gonna be one of the questions that I asked too is, um, you know, with, is this like a identity mapping exercise? Would that be something that is done in the beginning of the year? Um, and I, I wouldn't even think to, to do it at the end of the year, but it, yeah, our identities um, and those things that are most important to us are fluid and can change from time to time. So I think that's really, really fascinating. How do students tend to react when you do the identity mapping exercise? Um, they're usually really excited. I tell them that they can self-identify in any way. Like I'm not there to tell them what has to be on this map. Like we go over language around like what is gender, what is ethnicity. Um, so they're aware of what these words are if they choose to share those parts of themselves. Um, mm -hmm. But I also have them list like things that they're interested in, like hobbies, um, like favorites and things like that. Um, and then we'll also do other activities where they might be paired with another student and they have to identify what is similar with their partner and what's different um, for also for students to be able to get to know these things about one another. It's not just me knowing about them. Yeah, yeah. Do you share your own identity map? Oh, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. <laughs> Any of these activities, like if I'm going to ask my students to be vulnerable with me and with each other, then mm. I have to, sh I have to show up too. I love that. Yeah, I think that's really important to note. Thank you, Liz. And so before we run out of time, I want to talk about the last part of the guidebook, which focuses on the power of literature, which is one of the reasons I felt it was so important for Jason Reynolds to join us today. Um, in that section, educators will receive guidance on leading with positive narratives instead of those that are um, trauma-centered. Um, they'll learn how to use um, an ABAR lens to select books, and they'll also learn how to use um, stories to guide some of those um, courageous conversations. Julie, can you share a bit more about um, just the power of literature and why you included um, this in the guidebook? Absolutely. So stories are, you know, what unites us. And uh, when we think about having conversations about race and the power of stories to give us a lens into uh, the lives of others, I think of Rudine Sims Bishop and her, her statement about windows and mirrors and stories giving us the opportunity to see into the lives of someone else, but also reflecting back our own experience to us. Um, stories are incredibly powerful. Um, to, be a, to serve as a springboard to have a conversation where you talk about race. Um, and so in the guidebook, we, we go over how do you uh, select books that um, are uh, appropriate or that, that are informed from an ABAR lens. How do you evaluate the books on your bookshelf or in your classroom or even in your home library to make sure that you are inclusive and that you are representing multiple identities uh, among the books that you have. And so stories and being able to have conversations are incredibly powerful. And just to quote one of our contributors, uh, Cornelius Minor, he said something that I thought was so powerful. He said, every book can be a book about race. Yeah, I love even that. Even if there are only white people in it, or even if there are only, you know, it, it, every book is a statement about race. And so it is up to the educators to make those statements uh, come alive and to explore what the authors are saying or not saying and their choice of characters and their choice of setting and, and so much of how a book is, is or how a story is, um, is created and evolves. And so I think as we think about how we have conversations about race, so much of it is, as Liz mentioned, Liz mentioned earlier, developing that lens. And yeah. stories and have a wonderful way to help 
form that lens and help students see beyond just, you know, what's on the surface. Yeah, and I realize that we um, are throwing around just a few acronyms and some things that are probably very familiar um, to those of us who do the work, but we also have some folks on the call that this may be their first introduction to this work. And so, um, Liz, I will let you um, define ABAR, and if you want to add a little bit more onto um, the working definition of that, and then um, I'm happy to talk about windows and mirrors um, in literature. So, Liz, do you want to share with folks a little bit more about what ABAR is when we say ABAR? Sure. So ABAR stands for anti-bias, anti-racist. Um, and the way that I often explain this to folks is when we're thinking about anti-bias work and anti-racist work, it's rooted in action. So it's not just the things that we think, but it's how we actually show up in actionable concrete steps every single day. Um, I have worked with some adults who actually tend to be a bit resistant and even admitting like I have a bias. Some folks will say in the trainings I facilitate, I don't have any biases. I'm like the least biased person you know. Well, we all have biases. Like it's interestingly like a, a common denominator we all share and it doesn't matter what our identities are. We all have biased beliefs that we hold towards certain people or individuals or groups. Um, and part of anti-bias work um, that needs to be focused on is making sure that we can identify these biases in order to push back and dismantle them. Like how can we actually like rewire our brains to think differently mm -hmm. based on like the messages and stereotypes that we've absorbed throughout our entire lives. Um, and in anti-racist work, I think it's really important to um, reference and cite the amazing Angela Davis um, talks about the, the difference between being non-racist and anti-racist. A non-racist person doesn't use racial slurs, like doesn't belong to white supremacist hate groups, um, might like post a black square on their social media, hashtag Black Lives Matter, which is all like great, like it's all like working towards like that cause. Um, mm -hmm. But folks who are anti-racist are thinking about like their own positionality and power, thinking about how we can take steps every single day to push back against white supremacy um, and racist systems and beliefs um, in every aspect of our society. Thank you. And when we talk about books as windows and mirrors, and that term was coined by Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, we look at books as windows um, as their pieces of literature that children can look into and learn about cultures, communities, um, other communities that they might be curious about, right? And when we think about books as mirrors, that is, you're looking at a book and, and it is reflecting your own lived experiences. And so books obviously serve as windows for some children and mirrors for other children. And I think that's one of the reasons why Cornelius Minor said that, right? Which is that Anytime you pick up a book, it can be used as a tool in this conversation. We're getting a lot of questions come in. Um, and so I do wanna jump to some of the audience questions, but before I do, Julie and Liz, are there any, is there anything else that you wanna add? Are you ready to go right to the questions? Uh, I, I would just add that for educators who are, are looking forward to downloading this resource that we um, have tried to make it as chock full of, of as much of the goodies as possible in terms of giving you expert informed insight so that you have that, that uh, perspective, making sure that you have questions throughout that challenge your own thinking. Um, giving you uh, conversation starters to use with your students as well as activities. Liz's amazing um, uh, discussion about uh, inquiry-based uh, teaching is in there. And so we try to make it as, as um, meaty as possible, uh, but also recognize that it is a starting point and that this is uh, one resource that you will use. We hope it is one that you will find incredibly valuable. Uh, but just wanted to make that point before we head to the questions. Great, and I think um, some of our team members are dropping in um, some of the links for some of the resources that we're mentioning. So I'm going to go ahead and get to the first question here. Question number one says, I am white and teach in rural Vermont with about six students of color out of 700 and no staff members of color in the high school where I teach. I have an advisory with one black student and I want to talk about race with my advisory. How best to conduct such a discussion? Do I talk first with the black student to gauge comfort level? How do I conduct this conversation? Thanks for any advice. I can do one. Who wants to start? <laughs> Um, I think it's great for us that this teacher is taking all these things into consideration. Like like we were mm -hmm. saying earlier, Christine, there is often like 
while the yes, this work is urgent, like relationships need to be centered. Relationships need to come first. Yes. Um, and so I can't tell you like the script to use or anything like that. I don't know your student. You're the one who knows your kiddo best. Um, but I think that there are a lot of other educators out there in similar positions. So like general advice that I can give um, is making sure that you are taking, and I know I've spoken about this before, a trauma-informed perspective and lens um, when approaching the student, especially thinking about historic trauma, not just like individual mm -hmm. or ancestral trauma within that student's mm -hmm. own identity and family. Um, I think it's really important to make sure that when you are talking about race and racism in general, that it's important to recognize that this is a socially constructed idea, meaning that there is no basis in biology. Um, but I think that's really important for kids to know too, that there are not these inherent biological differences between people, but that race and racism are concepts that have been created by people for specific purposes, um, especially when thinking about power and oppression. Um, also, just talking about race and racism, um, I don't think makes you like an anti-bias, anti-racist educator. We have to make sure that we're also balancing out joy and power and resilience mm -hmm. in that too. Because thinking about the limited number of Black students you have, if the only messages they get about Black history and Black folks um, is receiving oppression and injustice from white folks, um, then what messages are they gonna learn about themselves? And what are the messages your white students are gonna learn about Black folks right. and Black history as well? Right. And, and Julie, I would any, add, sorry, go ahead, Julie. I was gonna say, I would just add to that, that as you engage with all of your students, it is incredibly important that you are, that you're representing and reflecting students of multiple racial identities in the books that you read and the art on your walls and the conversations that you have so that no matter if you're working with majority white or majority uh, brown and black kids, that every student is getting an opportunity to learn about uh, the life experience, the joys uh, of, of kids of all different racial backgrounds. Thank you. Um, next question, living in the South with its long, and long is in all caps, <laughs> history of active codified racism, getting white teachers and parents to engage is such a struggle and such is in all capitals. How can we build a community where the racial majority recognize the complicity of the society and then choose to move forward as allies? Oh, that's such a powerful question. Um, wow, I don't even know where to begin. Um, as a child growing up in the South, I can definitely attest um, to the truth um, of, of that statement. Um, and I think, I mean, this is part of moving that work forward, right? I mean, um, I saw so many educators who shared um, this event and the resources that are going to be a part of this event with their colleagues, um, knowing that they're probably going to get some pushback <laughs> and, and backlash, right? Um, I saw um, so many educators who reached out who were just like, we're so willing and ready to engage in these conversations um, that are from schools like the teacher in Vermont, um, where there may be only a few students of color. And I love that you said that, Julie. It doesn't matter if you have um, one student of color in your classroom or if the majority of your students, you should still be teaching from this framework, right? Um, anything that you all wanna add about that? Um, again, I'll repeat the question, living in the South with its long history of active codified racism, getting white teachers and parents to engage is such a struggle. How can we build a community where the racial majority recognize the complicity of the society and then choose to move forward as allies? What are some tips that you all might have for this educator and other educators with similar questions? So one thing that comes to my mind is the history. Um, it is uh, starting with history and finding ways to weave in uh, history within your lesson plans. So uh, whether you're teaching literature in you know, ELA, whether you're teaching math, whether you're teaching science, finding ways to weave in uh, individuals of uh, various racial backgrounds um, so that it becomes more a part of the conversation. I think part of what's so challenging is that race is often seen as very separate. I'm um, going seen mm -hmm. as, as an add-on, as something you do separate from everything else. And I think what we're trying to communicate and get forth in this resource, in the series of resources, is that conversations about race should be just normalized. 
Uh, they should be a part of everyday conversation. Um, and so uh, to, just to quote Matthew Kay from his book, um, Not Light But Fire, he talks about how um, students, how if, if you have, let's say, um, a specific um, goal for, for, for the fourth grade, I'm just guessing fourth grade, but if you have a specific theme for the year, finding very specific ways in which you can integrate and intentionally um, infuse conversations about race within that theme so that students don't feel like, oh, well, today is the day to have the race conversation or educators yeah. don't feel like today is the day to have the race conversation. Or it's February. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of the normal conversation. It's something yeah. that it becomes part of our collective awareness, I think is mm -hmm. just, just one way that that could possibly um, help kind of even that out just a little bit more. I know it's challenging. Trust yeah. Me. yeah, and I think a part of that too, I mean, I think school administrators have to play a role in that as well, right? I mean, they need to be leading um, this work, right? And so um, getting them actively involved and engaged, I think is also critically important. Liz, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, um, definitely building off of what Julie said, really trying to embrace anti-bias and anti-racism as a lens and really not as a separate part of the school day. Um, I think it's also really important to recognize what ABAR isn't. And I think with particularly the white uh, schools and students and communities, um, this idea of anti-racism means that white people are going to be shamed, that like little white kids are gonna get put on blast in front of their colleagues and feel really awful about themselves and their identities. And that's really not what this is at all. Um, I think it's really important for uh, white folks and white communities to recognize, and I like to use the word racialized identities too. I'm trying okay. to train myself to use that more. Um, to remember that race is something, because it was created by people, that has been done to people, and that's including white people. Um, to really look at different white populations, especially within the context of the United States, like Julie was saying, within history, using tools like the US Census to see how um, the idea of race has been manipulated um, over mm -hmm. time and place to serve different people, and to look at different groups um, of white communities um, who have been like granted into whiteness over time. So what white meant like a hundred years ago, if you were of, you know, like British descent and things like that. Um, but looking how, looking at how folks um, from Irish descent when they came to the United States were not considered white. Folks from Eastern mm -hmm. Europe were not considered white. Ashkenazi Jews were not considered white as well. And I know as Judaism as an ethno religion, there's a lot of like nuance there as well. But to recognize that everyone has a history within this and something really powerful that I think white folks and communities can do is trying to trace their ancestry and lineage and think about when did the people in my family and community become white. Mm. Wow. I will move on to the next question. Um, I am a white female reading specialist in a suburban middle school. Some of my black students have shared with me privately that they often feel uncomfortable when issues about race are raised in class discussions. For example, when they learn about slavery in their social studies class. Their white classmates don't say anything explicitly but white students may glance at them more often than usual. How can I create an environment in my classroom where black students don't feel like they're in a spotlight and issues about race are being raised? Liz, you look like you're ready to jump in. <laughs> oh, I was looking at Julie because she also looks like she's ready to jump in. <laughs> um, Julie, you want to go? Julie, go for it. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm hearing this question and I'm th honestly thinking of myself uh, when mm -hmm. I was in, in school. You know, I went to a school where um, there, you know, it, it was a majority white school and yeah, being that, that one or, or, or a few people of color in a classroom and you're talking about something, it is incredibly uncomfortable. Um, I think part of what made it so uncomfortable is that um, we didn't talk as much about the joy. Uh, we didn't talk mm -hmm. about, as much about the, the other aspects of the history of people of color, um, Black people in particular in this instance. And so when Black kids are in class and, and the focus is on the period of, of, of slavery, and we don't talk about you know, other parts of, of Black culture, then yes, that is, that is uh, very, very bothersome. Yeah, um, it can be uncomfortable. It's it very be, uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, it can be uncomfortable. Um, I think also that goes back to we talked about the types of stories that you lead with when teaching this type of, of, of history, right? And so, yes, if all you're leading with are those stories of trauma and the horrors and atrocities of slavery, it is going to be uncomfortable. But there are also stories of 
resiliency. There are many, many stories of resiliency um, that can be shared. Um, there are stories of joy. Joy can be found in every moment in history. I don't care what you're teaching. There is always a survival story of joy. Um, and I also think, you know, I, I agree with what you said, Julie, like, let's talk about the totality of our, of our history, right? And so, yes, if the only time you are mentioning Black students and their role in this country is when you're talking about slavery, that is extremely problematic. And I think it would make anyone feel uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Liz, is there, oh, sorry, go ahead, Julie. I was gonna say, and just to add on, you know, making sure again, having, you know, broadening that lens, what does that say to the white students? When mm -hmm. students of color are, you know, the only focus for kids of color is peer, our periods of oppression, um, what does that communicate to your white students? And so I would just yeah. encourage, you know, again, everything that we're saying, right? It's, it's about having inclusive stories. It's about having comprehensive, well-rounded stories about, about all groups of people. Um, it's cr incredibly important. Go ahead, Liz. <laughs> Yeah, I would add on to that and say that it's not just about like the message sent to your white students, just all of your students who don't identify as black. Like we know that mm -hmm. colorism, that anti-blackness is rampant in every part of our world, unfortunately. Um, this work does need to be for everyone. Um, and it can be, again, like really challenging, but I do think all teachers before engaging this work need to also think about if you're concerned about like the know the handful of students of the global majority or students who don't identify as white in your classroom or your school. Um, think about the representation, but also ask yourself, am I tokenizing these students? Like they might mm -hmm. be present, they might be visible, um, but how are they being represented? And am I really trying to be inclusive in all of my practices? Like Julie was saying um, that we have mentioned numerous times, it's not just about representation, it's thinking about how people are represented as well. And one, one last thing I'll say, uh, for those of you who will download the guidebook, that there is a section in the guidebook that has questions just like this that you can ask yourself. So as you develop your lesson plans, as you develop your, your program um, structure, you can ask yourself these questions so that you can check yourself essentially as you begin to move forward. Yes, at the end of each section are check-in questions for educators, teaching professionals, librarians, and parents to consider. Um, and then I have, I'm gonna, I have one more sort of history question here. Um, so I will jump into that one. I'm a sixth grade ELA teacher and I sometimes feel overwhelmed with the amount of historical context I feel is necessary for kids to understand the context and social construction of race. Where do you suggest we start? How far back in detailed do we go in a non-history classroom? Um, I just want to start by saying, you know, I all, I mean, as many of you all know, I write for young readers. Um, and I think, you know, by sixth grade, they should be, it shouldn't be their first introduction um, to, to the history, the real history of this country. And so I like to start with early readers um, and having sort of build on the history and context and knowledge over time, right? And so I think the charge there for that sixth grade teacher, what I'm hearing um, and what I am going to, I guess, challenge and ask some of the early childhood educators to do is to start having these conversations early and build upon them over time. And so by the time they do get to sixth grade, um, an ELA teacher isn't put in the position where they are forced to have to sort of teach this historical context from the beginning, right? Julie, do you want to add to that? You're not. No, I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you 100%. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Liz, anything that you want to share? I mean, it can, there's a lot to learn, but you also don't need to do everything all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I actually use some of the resources for students to educate myself, like the young adult versions of, of Stamped, you know, that Jason Reynolds also participated with, um, the young people's version of like Indigenous History of the United States. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I try to pace it because also this work can be really heavy. It can be really emotionally taxing, especially if you identify um, as a person of color, it can be a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to make sure that you are also learning and digesting in a pace that allows you to absorb it, but also doesn't become like too much. So the self-care aspect is really important too. Um, I would also ask that folks um, 
really try to expand their understanding of anti-racism beyond like a black white binary, especially if you have mm. students who identify as Latinx, if you have students who identify as anywhere on the Asian continent. Um, a really common complaint that I heard from my Southeast Asian students and my Latinx students when I was teaching in LA was that they didn't see themselves represented in any conversation about race or racism. And they would consistently mm. ask me, well, you know, if I lived 50, 60, 70 years ago, 100 years ago, where would I have been in this? Like, where were my people and how were we treated? Um, so really making sure that we are being inclusive in that way too. I love that. That kind of leads into this next question that we received, which is, to what extent will the guide and the book collections address equity and identity related to the stories and educational slash instructional needs for practitioners and families from the Hispanic Latino diaspora? language, culture, and issues of ethnicity and race have somewhat nuanced and contextual complexities within this U.S. diaspora. Um, Julie, would you like to speak to um, some of the books that are going to be made available? Yeah, so as part of this project with Pizza Hut and First Book, um, we're making available a number of books um, in paperback editions. And so making books that had traditionally been in hardcover are now going to be available in a more affordable paperback. And those books do include um, uh, stories from Latinx communities, from Asian American communities. And so I think part of the way we've approached this is that uh, the guidebook is, is focused on just overall conversations about race and then the resources that are being made available uh, will have more specific cultural and ethnic stories um, that you can share with your students. Thank you, thank you. Um, one question um, that I think um, probably many people have is how do we help other educators see their microaggressions? How do we see the microaggressions that we may be doing? And Julie, I know that this whole inner work was a big part of the guidebook for you, so I'm gonna let you jump in and take that one. I mean, I think, you know, we are at a place in society um, where we have to be able to talk to each other and we have to be able to hear each other. And so if we are in a, um, a school or a break room and someone says something um, or we hear something, I believe it's our responsibility to, to bring light to it and to, to speak on it um, and let people know. Sometimes people know, sometimes they don't. And I think if we don't take the opportunity to say, hey, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but this is how that sounded to me. And I think it would, you know, and, and have a conversation about it, then we, we lose the opportunity to educate each other and to help people get to a, a better place. I think a lot of times so many folks have great intentions, uh, but we just don't always know that sometimes our intentions still fall short of what, we, what, what we're hoping. And so we have to be able to have conversations with each other and to hear each other. I think both of those are really important. Yes, and a part of the guidebook does address microaggressions. Um, and we really, that was really important for us to include that because I think that this is a, an issue that comes up in many different ways, especially um, in the classroom. And so um, please download the guidebook um, and, and hopefully you'll find some information there that will also be a little bit more helpful um, on understanding um, microaggressions and how to address microaggressions, um, not only within the classroom, but also with some of your colleagues. Um, Liz, we have a, a question that is for you. Um, has Liz found a lot of pushback from parents when discussing gender with identity maps? Such a great question, because interestingly, I've gotten more pushback around gender than I have around race. And I wow. taught in like a very um, liberal city and a very liberal state for the majority of my career. Um, and interestingly, mm -hmm. the occasions where I've received pushback from about gender, um, both have been based on religious beliefs at home. Mm -hmm. um, so when communicating like any of this, like if you're talking about gender, religion, disability, race, like with your students and your, your families, I think something that anyone should do is making sure that there is a good amount of transparency, like what's happening in your classroom. And let me be really clear that transparency and permission are not the same thing. Um, a lot of the time, um, 
some of the concerns that I've relieved, received are not necessarily about the topic themselves, but just how the topic is going to be taught. Um, so if there is any way for you to front load information with parents and families and caregivers about, hey, like this week or this unit, these are the things that we're going to be talking about. These are some of the texts that we are going to be using, um, as well as following up if you do like weekly newsletters or things like that hey, these were some of the talking points that students brought up in class. These are some of the questions that they generated, um, just so families can have um, you know, a better understanding of what's actually happening in the classroom. Um, I've been really clear with those families about everything being student-centered and supporting our students. So I worked at a school where we did have students who identified as queer, who identified as trans and non-binary. And so what's the most important is making sure that those students are seen and validated and feel loved mm. and accepted in our classroom. So making sure that I'm shifting that um, from the adult back to like young folks, to the learners in my classroom environment. I also worked at a school where we had staff members and families who identified as queer, trans, and non-binary. And so making, making that really clear as well. Um, and I know that I'm speaking from an immense place of privilege because I worked in that community, had administration who were also supportive of this work, and that not everybody um, is in that same position. But I do think that being transparent and keeping everything student-centered um, are two ways that you can try to set yourself up for success there. Thank you. Um, we probably have time for about two more questions, so I'm trying to be um, highly uh, selective about what those are. Um, let's see here. I teach middle and high school math. I believe that a bar should be a part of my classroom too, but I'm unsure how to incorporate incorporate anti racist and anti bias work into a math curriculum. Are there models or existing resources to which I could look Liz you're nodding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so since I facilitate a lot, this is a question I get very, um, very frequently. Okay. Um, I'm actually writing a whole chapter about this, so I'm excited <laughs> to share. Okay, so um, I think it's really important to come back to ABAR as a lens, remember? So it's mm -hmm. thinking about not only like our what we're teaching, but how we're teaching it. So thinking about am I teaching from a culturally responsive lens, from a trauma informed lens? Um, Am I representing like real life situations and scenarios? Am I honoring different ways of student participation in the way that they problem solve? And I think particularly in STEM, um, oftentimes if you work at a very traditional school, if you had maybe more traditional like teacher education yourself, um, that you are going to revert to things like standard algorithm and math. Um, and something that I think it's been really interesting at the beginning of the year, especially going back to this piece of bias and like self identity is asking my students, Hey, can you draw a picture of a scientist? Can you draw a picture of a mathematician? And thinking about, I bet everyone can guess like the type of person that ends up on all their papers, like someone very Albert Einstein looking. Uh -huh. um, so making sure that they also see themselves represented um, in these content areas is incredibly important. Um, with my elementary school kids, when it comes to science, especially when we were talking about things like environmentalism, um, environmental justice and racial justice, are very much, like they very much go hand in hand. Um, you can look at climate change, you can look at food deserts, you can look at the way that black communities um, have been forced to live in areas with higher rates of pollution, um, uh, worse access to healthcare, like all of these things are embedded in science. And I have also had friends, like one of my friends, Ace, who's a science teacher in Philly, um, has done work in their um, middle school science class around um, like gender and race, like rooted in science and how scientific theories have actually been used to uphold like discrimination and in, in forms of injustice um, and mathematics. There are so many different ap applicable ways to talk to your kids about like financial literacy, um, mm. to look at data representations about how different um, issues like affect different populations. Mm. Like all of that is rooted in mathematics. And I find that I have a lot more student engagement when it's so easily connected and applicable to what's happening in the world. Love that, love that. Julie, is there anything that you wanna add? Um, no, I think that that was great. And I think it's, it's really important to tie and, and connect the dots so that students can see themselves reflected, just as you said, Liz. I think, yeah, I wouldn't add anything more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question. Has, um, let's see, what books would you recommend for fifth to sixth grade students on these issues? I teach social studies and science. I'm interested in both read alouds and whole class or book club text. Anyone? So I can't 
a, a specific book isn't coming to my mind in this moment, but what I can say is that if you go to the first book marketplace, um, the website Kyle mentioned at the beginning, fbmarketplace.org, you will find incredible books um, that you can use to guide conversations with students to whether it's focused on a specific uh, cultural or racial ethnic group or a religion, you will find books there um, that can help you. Um, there's a section called Stories for All, and I would encourage mm -hmm. you to go there. Um, but yeah, I, I can't think of a specific book, but I think, you know, if you go to the marketplace, you'll see many, many, many books that can help you. Yeah, and sorry for moving the camera around. I hope I'm not making anyone dizzy, but the light was like, eh. um, Liz, do you have any recommendations, books? That you that you've used, I think a lot of the young people's versions um, of books, like I mentioned, stamp from the beginning. There's the young people's version of um, People's History of the United States from Zinn. Um, I think Tataki's um, a young people's multicultural history of the United States. Um, Tiffany's book is great for this age. Oh, group. Tiffany's I book! Oh my gosh, yes, Tiffany yeah. Jewell. This book is anti-racist. Like, it's on my bookshelf. She's it's amazing. <laughs> She's amazing. Um, um, is really fantastic. And I think that if you are an adult who's also getting started in this learning, um, using those books yourself can also be a really good like personal education tool. Yeah, that's actually um, a trick that I have for a lot of adults who are, when they come to me and they say like, I'm just getting started in this work, where do I start? And I'm like, actually, this book is Anti-Racist by Tiffany Jewell, Stamped the Remix by Jason Reynolds, right? Because it is in such a simple, digestible form um, that I think it, it really works well um, for adults as well. And then also, once you have mastered and highlighted and flagged the text, <laughs> you'll be in a better position to have those discussions with your students. Um, I am going to take one more question. Oh, I love this question. I have been looking for this type of professional community. How do I get plugged in? Well, first of all, you're plugged in now because I have your email address, so you'll be hearing from me. Any tips, Liz and Julie, for folks who are looking to join an educational community focused on this work? Yeah, I think social media is really going to be your tool, especially if you are a teacher working in a community where maybe there aren't as many folks on board with anti-bias and anti-racist work, and it can feel really isolating. Um, if you are active on Twitter, um, like Val Brown hosts the, the Twitter group Clear the Air, and there are always like really amazing discussions and prompts and people engage with each other in really incredible ways there. Um, Educolor is another one on Twitter. Um, on Instagram, it's not quite as organized, but there are definitely a lot of folks like myself. I'm more active on there. Tiffany Jewell, Britt Hawthorne. Um, many educators also have like Patreon communities where if you're willing to like invest in the work, um, there are more folks who are willing to like engage and like share resources and different things like that. But certainly social media is your friend in this way. Yes. Yeah. I I, I agree. And I would say um, all of the subject matter experts that have contributed to uh, the guidebook into the series. Um, you, I would recommend you follow them. Um, they obviously, as you can see, you know, Liz's experience is incredible and insight, um, and she shares it so so broadly on on social media. So I would encourage you to follow all of our subject matter experts for this project. Um, and also in the guidebook, you will see a section. It's actually on one of the last pages. I encourage you to continue working to join a community, and so. Uh, Disrupt Text is also there. It's another organization very active on Twitter um, that you can follow and, and really find that community because I think one thing that's really important is this in this work is having that community. You know, whether you are in, you know, I know we had a question from someone from Vermont earlier, uh, whether no matter where you are, there are educators across the nation who are committed to this work and plugging in with them is so encouraging and uh, fulfilling and inspiring and helpful uh, when you have questions, you're able to, to bounce things off of people who are going through the same things or have gone through something that you're going through. And so I would encourage you to, as I mentioned, and as Liz said, you know, engage with social media um, and, and check out who we're recommending um, within the guidebook. Yes, and then of course, um, later today, we will hear from Dr. 
Cheryl Hoka McCoy, um, who runs the amazing Summer Institute for Education, Equity and Justice at AU. Um, and that um, event, there, there are lots of resources um, and it, it's a great education community. Um, we're getting quite a few questions um, from folks who saying that a lot of the questions so far have been focused on um, K through five. Are there any resources for high schoolers? Um, and Julie, that was a big part of the guidebook as well, right? Making sure that we're not just focused on early childhood education, but also understanding that those who, you know, educators who teach high school also face some of these same challenges. Would you like to speak to that? Um, yeah. So let me just tell you the two questions. So most of the questions are about um, K through 12 and then also um, would love if some of the questions, um, you know, that are posed um, focus on high school. And of course, many of you are getting ready to hear from Jason Reynolds, who of course is going to definitely touch on that. But Julie, any advice that you can give high school teachers who are joining the convening today? Yeah, so uh, within the guidebook, what we've tried to do is to provide you uh, content and information that can be used across pre-K through 12. And so uh, you'll see recommendations in there that, you know, there's going to be tips if you need to scale it up for a high school level student, uh, then there's recommendations on how to do that. Um, but, the, but overall, um, I would say that there are activities that you can find um, and having these conversations with high school students is going to be different, obviously, than having a conversation with an elementary school student. And so we've provided you um, language that you can use, whether it's uh, exploring a novel that you're reading in class or it's an activity that you're doing. Uh, we want to make sure that students, regardless of their grade level and their educators, have an opportunity to deeply engage with this work. And so um, without getting into you know, page numbers and specifics, you'll find it in, in the guidebook. We definitely got you covered, or at least try to make sure that you've got information in there that will be helpful. Liz, do you have any um, educator um, colleagues who um, teach high school? Just any tips that you might be able to add there? Um, yeah, I think because when students are older, if they are you know, more dependent, they have more autonomy in the classroom, making sure that you're really trying to create as many opportunities as possible for students to drive their own learning. Um, I think that if you work in a school where collaboration is really highly encouraged and folks are able and willing, um, making sure that students know that anti-bias, anti-racism isn't confined to just a particular subject. I know that um, English teachers, social studies teachers might be a bit more um, like open because it, it might seem like it's a bit more accessible just depending on text and like writing topics. Um, but if you can work together and collaborate with, you know, another person, another department, um, if you can have like an English and a, like a science collaboration, um, I think it can be really incredible as a way to enhance student learning there too. Thank you. Well, thank you both. Um, the time went so quickly. Um, and again, just Thank you, thank you both. Um, even though we weren't able to get to all of the audience's questions, the guidebook includes the Q&A section, right, Julie? Exactly, yes. And um, so that Q&A section includes some of the most frequently asked questions um, that first book received from educators as part of their 2019 survey. So please download the free guidebook, which can be accessed. Um, I believe the links were shared um, in uh, the chat boxes. Um, and I hope that everyone finds uh, this information that we've presented um, to be helpful in having courageous conversations about race and racism, and that it empowers them to make their equitable, their learning spaces, I'm sorry, more equitable. Um, and again, thank you both, and I think it's we're right on time to welcome our next star of the hour which is Jason Reynolds Jason are you there yeah I'm here can you see me um I cannot see you but let's see here now I can I see you. Hey, hey Jason. How, <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Good, good. I mean, ah, I feel like you don't need an introduction, um, even yeah, though I guess I, I do. Of course I do. 
<laughs> intro. Let's get let's get an intro. Hold on, I'm right here. Let's, I'm opening my blinds. I mean, uh, I don't know what I can say. I don't know what I can say that adequately captures um, your contributions to literature and your work with young people. I mean, I just feel like I don't have enough time. I think you're absolutely amazing. And I think I speak for everyone here today when I say it is such an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. Shout out to Pizza Hut. Shout out to First Book. Shout out to AU. Shout out to you, Christine. Everybody. All the teachers. <laughs> shout out to all the teachers. I want to say real quick before we get going, I want to just really quickly say to all the teachers, I appreciate y'all. Thank you for your work. We in tough times, with complicated times with COVID, despite dealing with anti-racism and trying to figure out how to uh, become more anti-racist, we also have to figure out how we're even going to teach in general. And so uh, for that, I just want to extend uh, my gratitude and my acknowledgement and uh, honestly, my humility uh, for all the work you all are doing. Yeah, I mean, it's such an unprecedented, such an unprecedented time. Um, and so this is probably going to be your most informal keynote ever in life, <laughs> but I hope it will rank among one of your most inspiring. Um, originally, I asked you I, to, you know, uh, to speak. And right. it's on a wait list, yeah. and if other districts to take advantage. Sorry, is someone on? Okay, thank you. Sorry, originally I asked you to do the keynote because, I mean, who doesn't love hearing Jason Reynolds talk, right? Um, but I love that you actually wanted us to have a conversation instead, um, because that is a part of the work, right? Being able to have conversations about race and racism. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna start with something you said when I asked you to join today's convening. Yeah. You said, and I, I know, right? <laughs> And I quote, I got the quote here. I'm always excited to get the chance to talk to educators who to me are the most important of civil servants. And although they teach formulas and structures that will someday lead our young people to gainful employment, one of their greatest responsibilities is to teach humanity. And mm -hmm. I just love that. So of course I made it the title of your keynote, which is now our keynote conversation. <laughs> So the responsibility of teaching humanity. Can you expand on that just a little bit for educators? Of course. I mean, I think first, let me say, let me say this. I'm not an educator, right? Um, in the traditional sense. So I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know uh, all the things because I just, I just don't. And I think people mess right. up when they start to believe that they know something when they're not on the front line. I'm not in the classroom, right? But, mm -hmm. but, but, I, but, what I, but I'm around educators all the time. I'm in schools, uh, pre-COVID, pre I was in schools 150 days a year. Uh, and and um, what I've learned is educators have an incredible opportunity uh, because what they do, okay, so parents obviously have the bulk of the, the, the job in sort of raising up sort of solid human beings, right? Right. Um, but educators, if, if they're doing it with their, with, with their whole selves, if they're doing it with their whole hearts, with their whole bodies, uh, have the capabilities of being the uncles and aunties uh, that, that, that a young person might listen to a little more than they might listen to the thing, right? So like, for instance, my mama say, Jason, you got to do this. I don't want to hear it. But if a good teacher tells me the same thing, or if my uncle or my auntie say the same thing, it's like, oh, well, I agree with them, even though my mother has been saying it my entire life, right? Right, uh, right. There's, a bit of di there's enough distance there. And if a teacher, there's a distance there and a familiarity. There's like this weird liminal space that teachers can live in where they, yeah. can, where they can really impact the child's life in a very different way. I can name the teachers that changed my life. I know exactly the moments in which they changed my life, right? And what they taught me uh, was, was no different than what my mother had been teaching me, but the way it was given to me changed my entire perspective. The way it was taught to me changed my, my mama is my mama, right? So for her, it's like, you do the things I need you to do because I'm trying to get you, get you where you need to go. A right. teacher, but my, my good teachers, because they weren't, they weren't all good, but my good teachers were like, <laughs> right? They were like, I'm going to give you some game that is going to basically further fortify what your mother has been saying in a way that doesn't sound parental. I'm going to teach this with context and buttress and history in a way that sort of sticks to who you are as you continue to move throughout the world without you having to be like, I don't want to hear that right now because you don't know me like that. You're not my mother, you're not my father. It was a very interesting right. And I think right. that's what have an opportunity uh, and quite honestly, a responsibility uh, to do. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. You know, I have a 
high schooler, a senior now um, in high school. And I remember her last school year, um, she came home, she's at, um, well, I probably shouldn't say that on this webinar, um, but she is at a school where she is there pretty much from nine to five. Um, and I remember her coming home one evening and I was just like, wow, I really probably get about a good two to three solid hours with her to educate, to teach, to talk about, to guide or whatever. But the majority of her day is spent in the classroom, right? And so educators do have this huge responsibility, um, but I think it's a responsibility that we should all carry, right? Mm -hmm. That we should share in the duty to help educators in this important work. Um, and you know, oftentimes I think we feel like we're protecting children by not sharing or, or saying certain things. We think they're too young or not ready to have these conversations. But that's not necessarily true, right? Because I mean, you've worked with some, some young folks who have really challenged you and put you up to the task, right? Of course, of course. I mean, I mean, ultimately, I think, see, his, uh, see, this is the thing, right? I think that, and this is the why I say the thing I'm saying about educators and their, and their sort of opportunity to affect change in a different kind of way. Um, one, educators are around young people who are around young people, right? Mm -hmm. Which is different. So, so usually if you have kids, like if, if my mom, it was me, all the dudes and the girls from the neighborhood in my mother's house, but that was pretty much it, right? Those were my friends. Educators are around kids who are around kids who are their friends and not their friends yeah. in the same space, which means they get to watch them navigate this space. They get to see who these young people are up against these other different, these, these, these different forces, whether it be people from the other side of the track or people from different religions, people from uh, different sexual orientations, young people who are existing in a microcosm right there in the classroom, which then inform who these young people are in a way that you don't always see in the vacuum of your house, first and foremost, right? Yeah. The other thing that happens, though, is that because young people are around all of these people who are like them and are not like them, they know more than you think they know because they're living in their version of the world. And their version of the world isn't necessarily an incomplete version. It's a whole version of their version of the world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so because of that, they have their version of reality, their version of sort of like how to approach uh, and navigate this sort of complicated spaces that they live in, right? And so I think for me, being around them all the time, you come into these spaces, you say something, and they can tell you based on their experiences in their microcosmic world, why you aren't making any sense to them, right? And so for me, yeah. it's like a prime example, you know, and, and I know we're gonna get into sort of racism and all the things, but a prime example would be conversations around gender. Everything, everything almost uh, over the last, five years that I've learned around the new gender conversation, right? As, as the gender conversation evolves, as the vocabulary changes, uh, as we build a lexicon around um, our, our new reality for some and our um, erased reality for others, everything I've learned has come from like 16 year olds. Right. Right? 16 Same. year olds, right? Who are, like, yeah. who are like, yo, like, you know, this is who I identify as. And I'm like, well, you know, I have some questions. And they're like, why do you have questions? Like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what I'd like to be called. And so yeah. respect, me, respect me and call me that which I'd like to be called. Very yeah. simple. That was 16 yeah. year old Christine. That wasn't some scholar. That wasn't some college professor. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. It was a teenager with like cornrows and a backpack who was like, <laughs> Yeah, get it together. Nala, Nala has checked me many times. Um, you know, I will say, oh, where's she? And she's like, they. I'm like, where are they going? You know, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's true. Um, and yeah, I mean, gender is a, is a prime example. Um, but yeah, when we talk about race and racism, it's, it's, it's the same thing, right? And I mean, I know that... Um, Unfortunately, COVID-19 put a halt um, in the book tour that you and Ibram were going to do um, for Stamp the Remix, um, but you've been able to have discussions online, um, you and Brendan with All American Boys. I mean, you've, you've had some of these conversations with, with children that a lot of educators may think are too young to yeah. have these conversations. Uh, They're not, right? Let me tell you something. You know what? 
Um, first of all, first of all, my, my dear friend, uh, Lori Hawks Anderson said years ago, she said, it's the insecurity of adults that become black mm. to children. Mm. The children been ready. You know, look, let, let's use a different country because we're also very, um, we're, we're an ethnocentric sort of community, right? Like we're, we're right. very sort of American centric. Uh, we have the American ego, the American, I mean, it's ridiculous how much we believe that we are the center of the earth, right? America, <laughs> America, America, right? And, and, and that like, and that our arrogance is, is sort of an example of our patriotism when that's not true, right? Those two things right, are not true. Right, right, right. <laughs> but but um, let's choose Germany. Now, okay. this, is a, this is a country with a sordid past. This is a country that has atrocities tagging along behind it, right? Forever and ever, it will bear the it will bear the brunt of what it has done historically, much like America, right? Yeah. But when you go to Germany and you ask them about the German educational system and about how they teach these atrocities, they'll tell you they start learning about Hitler in kindergarten. Kindergarten. Yeah. Picture books. Picture yeah. books about Hitler, right? And they have to learn the history of, of, of they have to learn the Nazi history of, of their country. Mm -hmm. Every single yeah. year of school, Christine, every single I know, year I know, school. I know. When you talk about the Berlin Wall, talk about when you go to Berlin, right? They, they say, look, we've left parts of the wall up, right? And not only have we left parts of the wall up so that everybody who lives here has to see it every day, we also have little plots. There are these little, these little circular medallions that are banged into the grid. They look like tiny manholes. And you walk over them every single day. But if you look down, what they have are initials on these manholes. And these initials are people who died at the wall, who died at the wall. And they're all over Berlin. They're all over Berlin as a reminder, as a living reminder that we have to interact with the history, our history, yeah. so that we don't, so that we never repeat it. Why, it, all we're asking for, or all we're pushing for, even in this convening here, is to say we have to create race conscious curriculums. It has to be a part of who we are culturally so that we can, so that by the time our children are 21, 25, 30 years old, it's not even a discussion about that which right. is really wrong. This is not anything to be argued, it's nothing to even yeah. debate. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes me think of the question um, that the ALA teacher asked, right? Like, what should I be saying at sixth grade? And that's why I'm like, by sixth grade, you should be expanding on information and conversations that have already happened, right? But that is um, a challenge, I think, that a lot of middle school teachers and even high school teachers even face, right? That they are the first ones oftentimes introducing some of this history and the complexities of race and racism in this country. And that is problematic. That is problematic. I think ultimately we, you know, we're not asking anyone to, uh, this is the way I think about it. Cause I know I'm always careful about, I'm always careful about sort of, like I'm never gonna lambast teachers, but I think they're doing the best they can in their environment. They are. Amazing. With their, so, I'm, so I'm always careful because I know that I don't, I'm, I'm not in the middle of Mississippi right now. I'm not in, right? right? I've, I've always lived in liberal places and where it's a little easier to have these discussions. But what I will say is when I, I'm not asking you to change it, Rick, I'm asking you to expand it, right? I'm mm -hmm. asking you, I'm asking you to, to sort of unfold the stories a little more, right? If we're going to talk about the Civil War, let's really talk about the Civil War. Right. If we're going to talk about, if we're going to talk about sort of, you know, because like, because what, what happens is in these curriculums, they, they drop little tidbits of this, that, and there, right? It's like, oh, well, this happened, and this happened, there were some slaves, you know what I mean? Or if you're in Texas, there are migrant workers, which is ridiculous. <laughs> right? Right. The textbook, the textbooks say it, right? But like, mm -hmm. little bits and pieces, all I'm asking is for educators to make sure that they're equipped with the information to unpack it and to actually give it true light. You know, Alfred Hitchcock has a famous quote that says, a face is not a face if I don't put light on it, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is you have to change and expose the true face of who, who we are as a country, the good, the bad, and the ugly, yeah. by shining light on it yeah. and letting young people know. Because yeah. young people know where we are, right? And, 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 and there's questions about sort of mm -hmm. like, you know, where we're going, but if they don't know where we've come from, then none of it is gonna make sense. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. Um, I was working on um, an early childhood reader about Sacagawea. And so learning about the Lewis and Clark expedition, 
I came across this information about York. And I think you remember I like posted it on Instagram. I was like, I cannot believe I am a grown woman learning that there was a black man who was a part of the Lewis and Clark expedition, right? Now, the early, early readers, you know, you get a very limited word count. Um, obviously, there was not enough room to tell his story. But I said, put him in the picture, right? Like, put him on the page so that even if his story is, someone is going to ask, who is that? Who is that? <laughs> right? Right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, teaching humanity, you know, although it's an honorable charge, as, as we're saying, it, 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 it's not easy. There's no way it can be easy. And I imagine, um, and I mean, I, I would dare to even say that there are probably, you know, a lot of educators that see it as more daunting uh, than noble at times. And so what are some ways that teaching professionals can approach this work more positively, more strategically? Yeah, first and foremost, I think you've got to be honest about your own humanity. Right, like I think mm -hmm. the, the one part about I'm always interested in like, all the different pedagogical sort of archetypes, and I always wonder like how much of pedagogy is about humility, mm. um, because, because I think that the the the, the, the <laughs> I teach college, right, and I have a there's a buddy of mine, a professor, uh, a colleague of mine, who was like, just remember, Jason, you're the expert, and I'm like, mm, that don't that don't really work in my classroom, yeah. right? That don't really work yeah. with my because the truth is, is that we're having, this is an engagement. Education in and of itself is a conversation, right? It has to be sort of a, a cyclical exercise, meaning that you are learning and you are teaching, right? Everybody in the class has something to teach as well as they have something to learn, right? And the, mm -hmm. way, that we sort of, the way that we can kind of think about this is if every single person is a world amongst themselves, there's no way that you could know about a world that you've never been to. You are an alien to that person's world. Now, from a macro level, Right, anything that is human cannot be alien to me, right? So like there's that level, but from a micro level, every individual in that classroom has a different life experience and has different things happening on the inside and the outside of them, have all kinds of things sort of orbiting their solar systems that you have not, that you know nothing about. And so I often wonder how much education changes um, if we give, if, if, if one, we, if we admit that we too are learning as we are teaching. Mm. Are things that I do not know. If I make a mistake, Right, I will not. I will not be made small because a student in my class whose parents might know more than me said, uh, "I wonder." My mom says this, and instead of instead of instead of becoming defensive, why not say, "You know what? Maybe that's true. Let me go and let me go look. Let, let's figure this out together." Right? Like I think it's okay. Yeah. I think it's okay for educators to come into a space exercising a certain kind of humility and saying that especially as we're sort of parsing out conversations around race that we're going to learn this together we're going to go on this journey together because we're all together. trying to get better about making this world a better place i think that's okay yeah yeah and jason you've had the opportunity to visit thousands literally so classrooms and libraries over the course of your career um, and share, if you can, what are some of the things that you wish educators knew about their students, um, and specifically as it relates to race and racism? I know that, you know, you and, and Brendan definitely had some challenges with all American boys. You know, sometimes schools think they're ready to have these conversations, parents push back, you know, authors get disinvited, all these sorts. Can you speak to some of those um, experiences? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, first I have to say that I've had more good experiences than bad, but I've had my of course. Of bad, you know, I mean, I've, we've been, we've been approached by active um, supremacists, like supremacists who, who consider themselves white supremacists. Yeah. Uh, who have come up to us and, and, you know, wouldn't even acknowledge me, but, you know, scolded, wow. scolded Brendan for not being white on the inside and that he was a disgrace to his race. Um, we've been sort of blocked by police officers who have sort of created blockades outside of schools because they didn't want us to come into the school even though we were invited there. We've been protested against, we've been written about in newspapers, we've had political cartoons drawn about us, and we've been banned all over the country in multiple states, and, and um, I mean, we've, we've seen all of it, you know, we've had our Just lives to have there. a conversation about race and racism in this country. Just to have a conversation, you know, and, and the wild part about it is that it's never the young people. Right, rarely, I mean, every now and then you got some kids sort of parroting what his parents are saying to him. 
and, and it's almost always a, a young man, which is another conversation we should have at some point. Um, <laughs> uh, almost always a young man, uh, uh, which is interesting. Um, but, but, you know, usually the parents who are angry haven't read the books, haven't even tried to engage with the information, just hear the word racism or hear the word white, right? Yeah. Like they can't even say white without yeah. people becoming offensive, even though white people, specifically white supremacists, love the word white <laughs> until I say the word white. You know what I'm saying? Right, when say, right, right. When I say white, all of a sudden, it's, a, it's, like, it's like it suddenly becomes, it has teeth all of a sudden. Right. A slur, right? Suddenly this, this weapon that, that they use, right? That they yeah. use, the moment I say white, it suddenly becomes, uh, you know, uh, they, they, it, it, I, I've weaponized it, you know? And it's like, yeah. You know, it's a descriptor, right? It's the way that we sort of categorize ourselves in this country for better or for worse. Um, so like all of those things, you know, but the kids, let me tell you, and this is the thing I heard, I listened to the last session, I heard uh, Julie and Liz and talking about young people. The wild thing is the kids 90% of the time are so game for the discussion, right? They're ready because they know it's happening, even if it's against their parents. I've had young people say, look, my father says these things at the table. I know they wrong. Yeah. But this Deals. This is what he's saying. What do I do? How do I? I don't know. What, but I know what he's saying is wrong. What he's trying to teach me, I know it is wrong. Right? And there's a lot of young, mm. there's a lot of young people who feel that way. I think we have to remember that they're living in a different world than we lived in. We have to remember that they have information that we did not have because they have the internet yeah. in their hands. So they can they can easily cross reference information in a way that we could not. Right. So like somebody saying, you know, that black people do this, that and a third, it's nothing for them to to right. hashtag. Right. <laughs> and suddenly it's like, mm, I don't know that. There's a whole lot of black people doing a lot of amazing things. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So I and I agree with you. I think I think there is, a, you know, oftentimes a larger part on the fear. There's fear coming from the adults. And I mean, a lot of that fear is rooted in how we were raised. It goes back to, again, doing that inner work that Julie was talking about, right? Like a lot of it comes from how we were raised, what we were taught, right? And there's a lot of unlearning that has to happen. And of course, the older that you are, the harder that unlearning is, which is why we really want to try and reach young people, you know, as soon as possible with having these conversations, right? Of course. Let, let me let me say this. Let me, like, this is. I'm always trying to think. People who are struggling with the conversation, sometimes the best thing to do is to create sort of analogous conversations, right? So that I'm going to do that now. Here's the thing. Let's talk about sex for a second. The interesting thing about sex, when it comes to parenting, right? And everybody, and I ain't judging no parents out there. You all got your ways of discussing whatever you need to discuss with your kids. But here's what I will say. Sex is the only thing, one, one of the only things that we expect our young people to be able to manage without us teaching them how to, right? Mm. Race is another one of those things. We, ex yes. we expect them to save the world, change the world, uh, to inherit the world, um, to be the leaders of the world, all this but we won't give them the tool. No guidance. We won't give them the tools early and early, 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 right? It's like you, uh, kids grow up 18, 19, 20, 25 years old with terrible relationships with sex. And we're all like, well, you know, you know but my mama didn't say nothing. My daddy never told me nothing. Yeah. Nobody, <laughs> I'm just supposed to know yeah. how, to, how to manage it, how to, something that is very natural to me. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to manage a thing that is intrinsically a part of who I am. And no one told me that it was intrinsically a part of who I am. And so now I have fear and mm. pain around all this thing that is a part of who I am. Racism is a part of the American psyche. It is woven into who we are. Mm -hmm. It is a part of our genetics, whether we like it or not. And I am supposed to grow up having all these strange feelings of that which is right or wrong. I feel shame. I feel fear. I feel ignorance. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't have language for it. I feel hate. Good love. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Nobody has ever said this thing that is in you, this thing that's a part of who you are, it does not have to consume you. You do not need to be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. You do not need to be ashamed of it. You just have to wrestle and grapple with it so that you have a better relationship with that thing. That's it. 
Mm. That's all. Wow. Whew. That is powerful. That, that puts it, yeah, wow. And it's, yeah, that is so true. That is so true. And why, why are we, why are we like this, right? And I mean, I think, again, it goes back to being rooted in the fear of having these conversations. As you said, the young folks are ready they have questions, they want answers. You know, we as adults oftentimes have this fear um, that is rooted in whatever our upbringing was, right? And so how can educators sort of move past this fear? I know Liz mentioned in our last session, like educators extending themselves some grace, right? So there's this big fear of saying the wrong thing right? Um, I know there's a big fear among white educators, especially that if they say the wrong thing, they're going to be labeled as racist and, you know, the fear that they could possibly lose their job, right? Like, so how, how, do, how do we encourage educators to move past that fear to sort of have some of these conversations? Um, understand that they have to extend themselves some grace. And, you know, I would, I would venture to say colleagues and parents also need to extend them some grace as well, right? Absolutely. I think, um, I think well, first thing you have to do is you got to get a couple of definitions straight, right? So okay. number, number one, there's a difference between uh, being uncomfortable and being unsafe. Now, mm. so what happens, so what happens is, and this is a fascinating thing, uh, and I've experienced this in, in real life, in public, with like in, in the auditoriums where people are like, I, I feel, and this, is, and, and this started a few years back when we started using the term safety um, in a really sort of a loose way, right? And we have to be yeah. careful about language because language grows legs and becomes other things, right? So we started to say, I want a safe space. I want a safe space. Mm -hmm. Now, emotional safety is a very real thing. I'm not going to, you would never hear me as somebody who's around kids. Emotional safety is a very real thing. But right. we have to make sure that we're clear about the fact that to maintain emotional safety at the risk of physical safety for other people is not, like, it's a no-brainer for me, right? We can't, yeah. those two things are not the same, right? So, so, what, so what I'm saying is, what we really mean to say most times that I'm uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable, yeah. right? But what yeah. comes up oftentimes is I feel unsafe. No, no, you're not unsafe. Yeah. You're just unsafe. Yeah. When, yeah. This yeah, yeah, yeah. Over, when this conversation is over, you will get up and go on about your day. Nothing has right. changed. But if we don't have this conversation, my physical body could be in danger. Mm. Right? My, if, we, yeah. if, we're not, if you look like me and we're not having these conversations that make you a little uncomfortable, right? then I remain unsafe. There's a distinction yeah. that, that we have to start making, right? So that's the first thing. We gotta make yes. sure we understand that discomfort is okay. Discomfort is okay. Nothing is going to Normal. happen. Yeah. Maybe you'll shed a tear. Maybe your stomach will be upset. Maybe you'll have a little lump in your throat. Maybe you'll feel, like, but that, that's all. Take a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> take, take a deep breath. Right, right. And here, and here, and here is, here's a different analogy. Conversation. I'm sorry, really quickly, really quickly, it made me think of your audio stamped, exactly. the remix, where you say, pause, breathe, <laughs> breathe. Your breath, right? it's so important, it's you're, so important. You're still, okay. you're still here, nothing is happening to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's, here's yeah. a prime example. The Me Too movement started, and suddenly every single man in the world was uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Every man, every man on earth, oh God, oh God, have I done anything? What about me? Is my name going to get called? So, and so on. And here's the truth about it. Brother, your discomfort means nothing. It means nothing if it means, if, if you being uncomfortable makes the women who are, who, are, who are calling out me too more safe, if it makes their bodies safe, if it makes, like, this is a simple thing. And so in order to do so, we, when I say we, in this case, I mean men, right? Myself included, have had to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, yes, misogyny lives in me. Yes, sexism lives in me. I grew up in a world that made sure of it. I grew up in a world that created, that created sort of insulators to make sure that I never had to get checked about my issues when it came to how I treat women. 
Yes, mm -hmm. and no, it does not make me a bad person unless I can't accept it so that I can then start to deconstruct that which I know is in there. Even if I don't feel like it's in there, it's in there. It will show itself. It is, it is ethereal. It lives in my body without taste or smell, but it will show itself, right? And I got right. to know that. And I got to live with the discomfort of that without feeling indicted and, oh, I feel so guilty. Oh, what am I doing? Yeah. Oh, I'm crying. They're attacking me. No one's attacking yeah. you. And no one would have to attack you if you live an examined life. If you live a mm -hmm. community, you know, you know what white folks been asking me lately? They've been, they've been DMing me and What's calling that? me emailing me, they were saying, Jason, uh, what do I need to know to, like, what do I need to learn to be better at this? You need to learn you. You need to learn you. There aren't enough. Yes. Books. It don't matter how many books you read. It don't matter how many stories you read. It don't matter if you know the, 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 all the principles of anti-racism. You got to right. know who you are. The parts of you that you don't want to know, but it's in there and you know what's in there. Right? And we got to wow. in terms of teaching it in the classroom and all of that and dealing with that sort of guilt, simple. Put the kids first. This ain't about you. Yeah. Put the yeah. Look, we gotta, yeah. we gotta be more loyal to our futures than our fears. Mm. We gotta be more loyal to I our like that. So you put if you if you lead with the children in mind, then you will put yourself if you will put yourself on the better coals every day. If you lead with the children in mind, you will throw yourself into the fire every single day. And if you make mistakes, all you can do is ask, ask for some grace. Right? Let your, let your intention be the thing that you lead with, right? Understand that just because you have good intention don't mean you won't have negative results and do your best to atone for the, for the moments where you make a mistake. It is okay. People are like, I don't want to be called a racist. Racist is like, somebody told me if you ever wanted to, to, to make white people feel uncomfortable, just call them a racist, right? That's all you got to do. Right. Any white person in the world, you drop the R word on them and they should not. It's, it's a weird it's thing. Bad. That's yeah. it. And the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, you already are. You already are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you already are. So what we're really right, to, right. So what we're really trying to figure out is how we can figure out how to not let the racism that already exists in you become harmful to the people around you and to yourself. Right. So, so, so it's like, right. Listen, I don't want to be racist. Why don't we start with I'm racist and let me figure out how I can start working through and undoing some of it. Then we can get over all the all the extra. Like I don't, I don't want to be caught. You already got. Let's get over that. Just yeah. like, I'm, like I'm already. Let's move. Right. Like. Wow. Wow. Yeah. No. No. I think that's. I think that's a really powerful way for not even just educators. You know, everyone to look at it, right? And not just racism. You know, we talk about. You know, we all have prejudices. We all have biases, right? And like really accepting and acknowledging that. And I love how you just said, we have to be more loyal to our futures. And our futures, to our fears, we, we, right? If, and I mean... If we talk about language, which, I, which is my world, right? Yeah. The word prejudice has been used to... Right. Uh, you know, it's this word that now has become like, it's poison, right? But prejudice, it simply means to, yeah. to, to prejudge. It means to prejudge and it's rooted in protection. So the, the reason mm -hmm. that like the prejudgment originally when the, when the word prejudice came to be was all about the idea of protection. It was literally based on our sympathetic nervous systems, the, like fight or flight. I have to prejudge the, 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 the animal. I have to prejudge the, the person. I have to prejudge the woods, whatever right. it is, I'm going to survive, right? And so these, the, the prejudice and the idea of prejudices and, and, and why we do it is a human thing. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, a, it's not formed, it's, formed in, in childhood. I mean, I believe yes. like formed as early as three years old look, is when the they moment, start forming. Look, the moment, the moment that you that you put your hand on a fire and burn it, you now prejudge fire. Right? Like mm, because you right. know that in order to protect yourself, you have to assume anything that is that is that, that is that is flame like might be dangerous. Anything that is hot might be dangerous, right? It's a human thing right what we're saying what we're saying is if if the necessity for protection overwhelms your ability to make sound decisions or see human beings as human beings it becomes harmful and problematic mm. so let's figure out how to gain control over our emotions over our our sort of biases that are put there usually to protect us 
Let's gain control over those things so that we can be human beings. And as human beings, we're not just, we're not just emotional things. What makes us different than, than we're, we're human animals, but what makes us different than, than animals who aren't human is we have the ability to lie for, for logic and reason. So we're saying the part of us that is instinctual, which is yeah. prejudice, let's, let's exercise some logic and reason and some grace and say, look, I'm a human being. Let me extend humanity to the human being in front of me, despite, mm. despite the triggers in my body that are saying that I should prejudge this. Prime example, really quickly, and, I, and I'll stop. Prime example. My mother, my mother was robbed at gunpoint in the mm. church parking lot 15 years ago, right? Wow. The kid that robbed her was a black boy with cornrows and looked like all my friends. Mm. So, so for the next two years, my mother struggled to be around my friends because, mm. because the trigger was, look, any kid, any black boy that, and she's a black woman raising black children, black boys, and she's right. like, any black boy that looks like this triggers some, my, my sympathetic nerve, it, it triggers something in me biologically, physiologically, that makes me feel a certain way. And I got, and then she said, but I gotta work through this because my child looks like this. My, my, mm. my, my child's friends, Look, my, my oh, all my children look like this, and I've got to work through this so that I, so I had to gain control over my emotions and figure out how to how to tap back into my logic and reason. The other issue is so many people out here hate black people, and they never even been around no black people, and so it really mm -hmm. had no reason to preach. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> wow. Well, as you can imagine, I am getting multiple questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, and so I definitely want to turn to some of those. One of the notes that I had on here was, I said, you know, Jason, I want to ask you one more question before we end. Look into your camera, ask that question, because <laughs> your whole chat. Um, if there's anything that you want to add to that, um, you know, because uh, again, I, I wrote that down because I really feel like educators need words of encouragement as they prepare to teach in this unprecedented moment in history. I feel that you dropped a number of gems today um, to encourage them. Is there anything else you want to add before I jump into questions from the audience? Just a few really quick notes. Number one, love your babies. Right. We, we, we say this all the time, you know, teachers, I, I, I know tens of thousands of teachers and, they, and, and, and most of them, most of them are like, yo, I just love my kids. I love my students. I love my students. I mean, you hear it all the time. It's the one thing about teachers that I love the most. I love my kids. I, I miss my classroom right now. Teachers are like, I miss my kids. I miss my kids. Yeah. I love them. Well, here's, here's the thing about the word love. Love does not come without risk and sacrifice. Mm. Period. Right? So, 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 so if you love them, love them, right? That means you gotta, you gotta push a little bit. You gotta push. If you love yeah. them, you're gonna have to risk a little bit. You got to sacrifice a little bit, even if it means a little of your own comfort um, by mm -hmm. teaching something that might be new and a little dicey that might stretch you outside of your comfort zone. I know some of y'all got lesson plan that you've been using for the last 15 years. It's time for a change. Yeah. It's time for a change. And I know I'm preaching. Like I always say, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but the choir got to got to learn new songs sometimes. Mm. I still got to go to choir practice. Yeah, right? That's time that we got to push forward. Number and number two, the last thing I'll say is we use Dr. Rudy and Sims Bishop all the time, right? We use mm -hmm. this quote. She might be the most quoted uh, uh, children's literary scholar in the history of everyone with windows, right. with windows and mirrors and so, and she should be, right? It was a brilliant sort of a, a metaphor that she came up with, but we leave a part of the essay out. The third, the third thing that she mentions is sliding glass doors. So the, the, yep. the essay is really about windows, mirrors, and, and sliding, sliding glass, glass doors. doors. It is. And, yep. and, and the sliding glass doors part is the most important part because if we're having a conversation around anti-racism, and like you heard Liz say, anti-racism is about action, the yes. sliding glass doors part is what eliminates voyeurism. So like window, a window is literally you being separated from the thing. You're looking at mm. the through a lens and saying, look at that, look at that person over there. Look at that person yes. where 
I am, but it's over there. If you're looking at the mirror, then you're looking at you, right? You already know that person, right? Here I yes. am, reflected back at myself. The sliding glass doors give us an opportunity yes. to immerse ourselves empathetically in a, to go back and forth in the liminal spaces of each other's lives and to actually figure out how to grab a hold of something that we did not know, how to plant our feet in the grass of someone else's yard. It does not mean that you own that grass. I want to be clear. Right, right. That right. ain't the house, right? But right. It does mean, but, but, but it makes more sense for us to break down the binariness, the bifurcated mm -hmm. nature of the conversation of like, it's them and us, right? Yeah. And black and white, or it's it's everyone and white, me uh, and black, or sometimes yeah. everyone and white, depending upon how you look at it, right? Um, yeah. But really, it could be like, yo, how is, is there a way for us to do this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is to exercise the sliding glass door. That's what literature, specifically fiction, is truly for. And it's the yeah. part of that essay that we should be tapping into, and we never do. Uh, she's been yeah. quoted, quoted and quoted and quoted. She's been it's so true. It's so, I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of that as well. And it's so true. And I think, you know, most authors and, and educators, they know about that sliding glass door um, part of the essay. But yeah, we do. We focus on the windows and mirrors. We forget that books are also sliding glass doors, maps, right? There's so many things to help young people navigate this world. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, right? Like we expect them to inherit this world and do great things without giving them any sort of map, guidance, compass, tools, figure it out, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, we have the internet, um, but we also so now that the internet is full of misinformation, you know, one of the things that you also talked about was early on the educators that were opportunity to really, really use um, as windows and sliding glass doors and, and maps. So thank you um, for that. Um, I want to go ahead and do um, some questions from the audience. Do you advise students um, to approach their parents that are sharing racist ideas with them? Have you had this come up in um, any of your sessions with young people? How do they address or approach these conversations with their parents um, who are sharing or harboring racist ideas? I mean, it's tricky, right? Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm always careful about answering questions like this because I, Mm -hmm. Everyone's household is different, um, but I yeah. but I know I, I know that I, I've known young people who have used uh, family books, right? Who've been like, look, we're all going to read this book, you know what I mean? And has yeah. some has some discussion around it, and 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 there are a lot of parents I think who who don't want to disappoint their children, who want to mm -hmm. do right by their kids. I firmly do believe that, um, even if. Yeah. Even if they disagree with them, and I think a lot of parents will 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 sit through things that they don't want to sit through if it means the betterment of their children or if their children care about it, you know. Um, and so I think one, books books are yeah. always wonderful. Uh, I think two, sometimes just saying the thing, and if your mom or dad disagrees, it's okay. That, it's okay that they disagree. Like I think the beauty of of life is autonomy. Um, the, 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 yeah. the complexity of life is believing that that autonomy gives us the right to change the minds of everyone around us. Uh, and and the right. <laughs> right that 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 that's where our ego kicks in. The truth is that look, yeah, I, I I there are things that my mother and I when I was younger disagreed on that she now agrees with twenty years later. But it took some time. But it took some time. And, and honestly, yeah. I stopped pushing. I went on to learn the things that I learned, and I mm. sort of and I and I modeled what it is that I believe that the world needed to be. And my mother fell in love. My father yeah. the same thing. My father, my father and I had a conversation around around sexism, and he cracked the joke. I pushed back on the joke, and then he said, "You know what, kid? You're right." But that was at 35 years old. You know, you know. Right. And, and so I think I think we have to remember that our parents, the 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 arc of growth uh, is still a long arc. Um, the the arc of, of learning and changing is still a long arc, and that our parents are just on the arc like the rest of us, and that sometimes it takes time for them to get to the place they need to get to if they ever get there. But it doesn't mean that you stop your mission. It doesn't mean that young people stop learning and growing and changing. We're supposed to be better. Look, every parent on here would say, "I want my kids to be better than us." Well, then do that, right? Like, 
Young yeah. people, young yeah. people be better than your parents, right? No matter what your mom and dad got is saying in the house, your job is to be better than your parents, right? That, that's the way that we keep the world yeah. moving forward. And the other thing I want to make sure we all understand is children are the, are, are the only vested interest for all of us, right? And so sometimes, it's okay, mm. so sometimes it's okay for you to use that to your advantage, teachers. It don't matter the politics. Seriously, it don't matter your politics. It don't matter your gender. It don't matter your sexual, your sexual preference and orientation. It doesn't matter your religion. We can all agree that we want our children to have a fighting chance in the world. All of us. It don't matter mm. what you got. We can all agree that children deserve a shot. And so teachers, use that. Yeah. Use that to your advantage. That's your leveraging. That's your leveraging chip. Use that to your advantage when it comes to sort of uh, prodding parents to, to, to engage in these kinds of conversations. Yeah, you know, as a parent, I can share that, um, you know, oftentimes young people, they will try to have these conversations. Um, and if they don't, I just want parents to know that the conversations are not going to go away. <laughs> they just end up having the conversations with their peers. Um, I remember, and Nala does not know this, um, so I hope she's not watching, but I remember reading some of her text messages <laughs> uh, with her, with some of her classmates, um, and they had been reading about Little Rock, um, and they were just all going back and forth in this group chat about how ridiculous it was, they couldn't believe it, you know, some of them could imagine their parents being there. And I just remember them making this pact that they were never going to let race impact their friendship, right? And I just remember being like, right? But there was, there's so many parts to that, right? The, the part that I want parents to understand is that they will continue to have these conversations. Your unwillingness or your refusal to want to engage or not have these discussions is not going to make them go away it is ultimately either going to lead them on a path to talk to other young people who are like-minded and who will listen or the danger um and jason i wish we had more time to talk about young boys being um sort of almost targeted um, online to be groomed Breaking some up. of these um, hate groups. Really, you have to have these, um, um, really, you have to, you know, dig deep, as you said, and sort of have these conversations um, and deal with the uncomfortableness of it. Um, I want to move on to another question here. When we are discussing the good, the bad, and the ugly of U.S. history, does it need to be put in the perspective of world history? That's humanity. For example, slavery has been practiced across the globe from the beginning of time by all races. U.S. history includes Native American tribes, Native Americans and Blacks that owned African American slaves. It's a messy history. I know you have heard this narrative before. How would you like to respond? Um, so, Christine, I want to say first that you're breaking up, just so you know. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me see if I can move here. Yeah, over there. Okay. Um, so, okay. Here's the thing. I think I think that uh, I'm, I'm. I always believe in teaching sort of contextualized history, right? So, okay. so yes, I believe in teaching world history. Uh, if there is time and room for world history, right? If you're if if world history is a class, which it would have to be, by the way, mm -hmm. for it, right? Like, of course. Um, I also think there's a way for us to contest. So like, for instance, right, if we're going to teach slavery, if slavery is the conversation, then we can teach how slavery was a thing all over the world for various reasons, but how no slavery system was like the American chattel ever. No slavery system was like the American chattel slavery system, right? Uh, anywhere on the, on the planet. It can never happen the way it happened here. Uh, the masterminds that put it together, 
the, the complexity of it, the length of time that it lasted, um, and, and how it was used to grow an entire country, right? So if we're going to contextualize, we have to make sure that we're contextualizing it. So we can say, look, slavery existed over here for these reasons. There were prisoners of war, which was another huge part of it. There were people who were traveling into Africa and pillaging Africa, but then going back to their homes, back to their home countries, right? Like the Portuguese, uh, right. or all of, all of Europe for that matter, the, the, you know, uh, and using the, the gold of certain places, the resources of certain places to build up their countries, right? Um, so all of those things are, are, are very true, but the American story is a very, very, very different one. And I would hate for us as Americans to, to, uh, to be distracted, right? Because what happens is when we do it this way, sometimes if we're not careful, if it's not, or if it's not taught in the, in the sort of larger scope fully, fully, right? Uh, then I think what happens is that it becomes a distraction and then, and then the, American, the American part of that history becomes more watered down. So if we're gonna, so as Americans, I think it's important that we know our history, especially as we continue to tout ourselves as the greatest country in the world and so forth and so on. Uh, and as we live as Americans in this country, trying to understand why we are where we are and how we got here, um, I just would say that you can teach world history to contextualize, to, to contextualize American history. Um, that would make the most sense to me, given the amount of time that teachers normally have. Okay, is my audio better now? Your audio is a little better. Your video is frozen, though, but it's all good. I can hear Okay. You. Well, no one's here to really see me anyway. They're here to see you. So um, next question. As a school, we are hyper-focused on testing to the point where it eclipses other work. How can I begin to talk to my colleagues and administrators about how racist and inequitable it is to focus so much on testing when we are in an environment that both celebrates those who do focus on it and punishes those who do not. Do you need me to repeat that? Did I break up? No, I got you. I think I got you. Okay. I, think, I think this is tricky. Um, this is super tricky. I know a lot of teachers are dealing with it. I think, I think in all of these training, first of all, I want to say the testing thing is so complicated just because of all the politics involved. You know, this, some of this stuff is coming down from the federal level, from state level, and you know, it's just a complicated thing. Um, I do think, though, that it's easy to refute it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, testing is such an easily refutable thing, right? Just because, yeah. to some extent, I mean, because at this point, I mean, we've been having the testing conversation for, for over a decade, two decades probably at this point, right? Really discussing whether or not it's fair, if it's equitable, or even if it's actually working the way they say it is, which is supposed to be, if we test, we'll be able to see which schools need, the more, resor need more resources and then pour resources into those schools to get the test scores up, which all of us on this call knows never happens. Right? Right. So, right. right? It's like my test scores are down, my school needs resources, and yet the resources never actually come. Um, right. So, so if you're not going to pour the resources into my school based on these test scores, let's eliminate the test scores so that I can pour into these children. That makes the most sense to me, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but but to, to answer the question, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know how to get around it. I, I know that like there's all these Except for except for coalition, right? Like all mm. I can think of, all I can think about is, and I don't. And you have to forgive me, y'all. I'm not. I don't work on the educational policy side. I don't. I don't know all those things, but I do know that there is nothing that has changed in this country without pressure. Mm. So, so I think that you you form coalitions, you form alliances with other teachers, you form alliances with teachers outside of your school and people in your district and maybe people in your state, and you figure out how to apply pressure, right? And, and, and you, and you mm -hmm. like I always say, I tell the kids all the time, there's a difference between being irreverent and being irresponsible. Um, I think irreverence is necessary for change, but irresponsibility is irreverence without planning, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, so I think that you plan, I think that you put together some sort of coalition, and I say you apply pressure. However that looks to you, that's for you to come up with. I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous and reticent to give any, because that's- <laughs> Yeah, specific know, advice. Right, because I don't know where you are, what you're dealing with, right? But I do know that what you're saying is true. I am certain of that, um, yeah. and so, I, so I would say that you fight it that way. The other thing I would suggest, um, uh, I had a buddy, brother named Victorious Hall. For all you educators, this is a guy that I would suggest you look, look, just look for him online. Victorious Hall is an educator. Uh, brother is brilliant. He's out of the D.C. area. And um, I remember going to one of his classes years ago when he was an English teacher. Now he's like a principal or something. He was an English teacher, and he was like, look, I got to teach to the test, but, I, but that don't mean I got to teach what they want me to teach. Right, mm. there's a way for we got to get creative and find our loopholes, right? And so, when he was teaching, it was the autobiography of Malcolm X. 
and he was using it to teach subject verb agreement and plot and setting and tone and vocabulary and then he was using that book right and so he's like look instead of me that way he could have he could talk about all the things in one he could he could still sort of discuss sort of our racialized lives and yes. and teach english because that book is brilliantly written by one of the great i mean alex Haley, one of the greatest american writers to ever live there's no question about it right and so right so he could do both of those things and they couldn't they hated the teacher their principal hated it but they couldn't <laughs> but they couldn't do nothing with him because the right. tech course were up. Wow. The test scores were up, you know? And so I think we can find sort of create, if we can't do away with it, we have to find creative ways to bucket um, where we can kind of, you know, two bird, one stone. So I want to, we also have a number of international educators who are on, um, on the call and at the convening today. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, Jason, I want to ask you a question from an international educator. It states, I have faced a different kind of pushback in educational institutions outside the US in which administrations and staff do not believe in having these important conversations or view them as taboo. Furthermore, they view Americans bringing up these issues as, quote, sensitive Americans and doing so as some kind of cultural imperialism. What advice would you give to teachers abroad to make sure that they continue doing the work while still respecting their host countries and their people's cultures, attitudes, and beliefs? I mean, first, I mean, first of all, uh, first of all, shout out to the world. These guys are like <laughs> right. the national folks here. But but I think it's it's tricky, right? Because the world is big and it's broad and it's vast. Um, and, and because of its bigness and its broadness and its vastness, there are, I mean, there are, you know, millions of different cultures in the way that we sort of engage. And yet, and still, the one, the one perennial thing that moves throughout the world, almost, almost all of the world, is whiteness. Like, mm. like, and this is the, this is the part about it that I find most fascinating is that if we really, if we talk about world history, the one part of world history that we really got to discuss is how little teeny Europe conquered the majority of the big old world, right? This little yeah. teeny continent conquered the majority of the world. And because of that conquering, because of them sort of spreading out and, 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 and taking this and taking that and building this and ruining that, right? All of this, that, and the third, whiteness actually exists. It blankets the earth almost. Mm. It, like it's the majority of the world right it don't matter where you go it, it's, it's just that we don't know what we're looking it's just we don't know what it looks like everywhere right, right. so, so it's, it's no different than going to a country where lighter skinned people are treated with more privilege the reason they're treated with more privilege is because of their proximity to whiteness right mm. like, like that that's what it's about yeah. right if we go yeah. and we can talk about hair politics we can talk about of course the intersections of class we can talk about all these sorts of things. Um, and, and I would say that you, no matter what, I mean, look, if you are in a, if you are in a country that is not Europe and y'all got a British accent, that's because of whiteness. Right, <laughs> like, right, right. If you, if you are in India, right? If, if you are in, uh, where was I recently? Malaysia, I think it was somewhere, uh, where about, I mean, somewhere in, I think it might have been Malaysia, no, I don't remember now, uh, Singapore. If you were in Singapore, in Singapore, they speak with, I mean, the, 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 the king, queen's English. Mm. I think that happened. Yeah, like, like, yeah. Like, this is a very real thing. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, would just say, I, I would just say that that whiteness isn't something that is just affect, that has just affected America because of the construct of race, right? Uh, yeah. Europeanism, right? And the whiteness that sort of, whiteness as a force, right? When I say white, I want to make sure it's clear here because people don't, maybe we should define this. Whiteness, when I say whiteness, I'm not talking about white people, right? Yeah. What I'm talking yeah. about is whiteness as a force, as a cultural uh, force that has dominated the world. And what, and what I mean is the standardization of humanity as a particular, as, as, as a particular sort of like, uh, as a particular thing, right? Anytime that humanity has been standardized, that means that something is, 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 is oppressive because human beings aren't right. standard. Right, we're all different. Right, right. But the, fact that, but the fact that we all know that a suit and tie is professional is white. The fact that right. we know 
that straight hair is 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 is, is pretty is white. The mm -hmm. fact that we know that lighter skin means means something. Or if you, I mean, yeah. that that's white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, and that and that actually came up. That actually came up. One of our questions. We have someone saying whiteness is a major problem, but so is colorism. Um, and the question is, can you talk about how colorism affects the black community? Um, but I would even venture to say how it affects all communities. Colorism, colorism is, I mean, the black community, it, it, it's a complicated thing. Um, yeah. and, and look, here's the thing about colorism in the black community and, the thing, and even the thing about uh, sexism in the black community. Um, if we, I think sometimes we had these conversations in a vacuum Right, we sort of pluck them out and we say, we'll talk about colors and we'll talk about, you know, in the black community. And I don't think you can talk about anything in the black community without giving it historical context. So, the right. that, so, so, so colorism is a terrible poison in our community. But the reason why colorism existed in the first place is because lighter skinned people were being, were being privileged, right? They were being given more resources. They were, they were, their lives were being spared in certain ways. They were being given more opportunity. And the reason why isn't because of us. It's because the people who had the, uh, the, the capacity and the ability to give forth those resources could say that they were closer to white, right? That is, that is the point, right? And so, and so over time, it's become this, this nasty thing where it's like lighter skinned people are this or that, or darker skinned people are this or that, are, 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 more violent or savages and lighter skinned people are more mm -hmm. pretty, more intellectual, and, yada, yada. and this is woven into the, the you know, even from the boys, I mean, from, from the slaves that were in the home, from right. go on and or from the from the creation of biracial people through slavery in America specifically, uh, through through slavery usually from, unfortunately uh, from from the taking advantage of an assault of black of, of African women by slave masters. All, all of this can go. We can use all of these things to contextualize it. Um, and I think after that contextualization, then we can really get to the heart of the matter. It doesn't. You don't have to be white to perpetuate white supremacy. Right. And colorism is a prime example of that. Right, men, mm. men who are obsessed with anything that is light skinned and I ain't saying that you don't that that, that light skinned women, quote unquote, light skinned women or men aren't black. They are black, right? Black, mm. black, blackness comes in all the shades, right? But the obsession, mm. the obsession, the unhealthy obsession with it, or putting it uh, at a higher space than any other color, I think, is just black people perpetuating white supremacy, and that they, and that even in the perpetuation of it, black people are still victims of it, right? That. Mm. that, that it's still a victim of it, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. Cannibal, it's cannibalizing us, basically. Yeah. So we have a question here from an educator about white saviorism. Oh, There's been. Favorite. Can you hear me? My favorite topic. Go for it. <laughs> All right. There has been a lot highlighted about instances of the quote white savior. How can we best step aside and promote opportunities and spaces for people of color to have the floor and to be the voice of change without being the quote, white savior? What recommendations do you have for white educators who want to continue in the anti-racism work and be the catalyst for change without taking away the power or platform of those of color? Um, and I think um, just, you know, we have to assume that there are people who have never heard of white saviorism before. If you can give just like a brief overview of that and then um, respond to the question. I mean, I like to look at white saviors like cookie monsters. But, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, let me, let me, this is a new analysis. Let me, let me hear this. And what I mean is when a white person do something for you, they just, they feel like they deserve a cookie. Right, a white person stand up for for, for anti racism. It's like, well, I did do that, right? So a white yeah. person believes that black people can't save themselves, um, mm. and then they, they come in and they cape on to save us because we need saving, right? We're still we're still underdeveloped and uneducated. All this nonsense that's not true, right? We're, that we're that we're victims. No, we've been victimized, but we are not victims. Uh, yeah. people, you know what I mean? Um, and, and it, this roots back. I mean, this goes back a long, 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 long time ago. Literature right. had a big part to play. By the way, as a writer, literature had a huge part to play. It's the reason why so many people have a hard time with *To Kill a Mockingbird* now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, so, um, what do I say to the to, to my my white brothers and sisters who have a feeling of benevolence and want to figure out what they can do in this moment? Here's the thing. First and foremost, you got to be clear about about. And Christine, this is the part of the conversation that nobody ever wants to discuss. When are we going to talk about self-interest, right? Mm. 
Because white folks, white folks, I got, I got a lot of questions. You know what I mean? I got more questions than I got answers about mm. exactly is your self-interest in the situation? Because human beings typically only move from, on self-interest, right? That's typically right. the way that we operate. What is this gonna, what is this gonna do to benefit me in some way? Right. Now, sometimes what we're doing in this moment, I think we have a lot of good, well-intentioned, and I do mean this, I'm not being flippant, uh, white yeah. folks who really are trying to figure out how to do the right thing and to be helpful. But if we're being honest, the self-interest is still there, even if it's in the absolution of your own shame and guilt. Right? And so, yeah. so the first thing I, you have to ask yourself is, what exactly am I, like, what am I getting from this? Um, and, right. and it's in the managing of your self-interest that, that, that you'll begin to loosen up your cape a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing is, is I think you said it in the question, how do we get out the way? We get out the way. Get yeah. out the way. I think you have to remember that Black people need to be seen and not saved. Mm. Right? No one is asking. Yeah. No one is asking for you to speak for us. We're asking you to give us the microphone for us, so that we can speak for ourselves. If you want to use your power and privilege, though, if you really want to amplify the voices of the brown and black people around you, and walk into the boardroom and say, "When are we going to diversify the boardroom?" Mm. Right. The board is looking a little white, especially in a little male too. When are we yeah. going to put color in here? Put some paint where it ain't. Right. right. You, you walk. <laughs> Right, you, you figure in, if you have a position of power, a hiring, yeah. right? You figure out how to diversify the how to diversify the hiring pool, right? And you don't say yeah. things that it's not a good fit for us. Well, if they're qualified, mm. if they're qualified, they are a good fit for you, right? Yeah. You figure out like this is what you can do with this power. You know what the you know what you can do with your power more than anything is silence. Mm. Quiet for a second. I'm saying be quiet because there are other voices that need to be heard that can't be heard over yours because even when your voice is 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 a minimal voice, it's louder than the rest. So sometimes you gotta defer. You gotta be the one to say, like, hey, I think we should ask, you know, James what he thinks. I think we should ask, you know, Jana what she has to say about this. I mean, I don't, you know, maybe she has something to offer because you gotta understand, and I mean this especially when it comes to black women. And Tony Morrison said this a long time ago. Black women are are one, the to me, black women are the most important Americans. I'm not gonna put the burden of saving the country on you. I think that's ridiculous. But what I will say is black women, uh, they live in the most intersectional spaces. They literally have the most to offer when it comes to almost any conversation because they live such splintered and, and diverse and polylithic lives, more so than every single other citizen in this country. Uh, mm -hmm. The black woman has a very different experience and has something very different to offer. So if you got black women around you and they're not speaking, then blame yourself. Mm. Right? Bl blame yourself. Take on the responsibility and say, <laughs> let me figure out how I can make space for this black woman yes. who has something very valuable to offer so they have the space to, 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 say, to say their piece. And I guarantee it'll change the temperature of your, of, your, uh, of your environment. The other thing, though, is y'all got to toughen up a little bit, right, folks? And I do mean this. I mean this sincerely. Y'all got to toughen mm. up. Because the truth yeah. is, as soon as a black woman starts talking to you, y'all get, the, get the, the tears, get the welling up in your eyes. And all of a sudden, everything <laughs> is, you know, it's like everything is a personal attack. Like, like, ain't nobody. Yeah. But just because she's speaking to you directly, and by the way, the reason that she's speaking to you directly is because she respects you. And she cares, right? And she cares, right? Mm -hmm. If she ain't respect you, trust me, as somebody was born and raised and by a whole bunch of black women, if she don't respect you, she ain't even going to acknowledge you, right? Mm -hmm. She don't even see you, right? So the fact mm -hmm. that she's even having a discussion with you and it's a frank and direct conversation because who has the time to eggshell, you got to like toughen up. It's not a personal attack on you. If anything, you should take it as a compliment that she felt enough about you to tell you the truth. Right? Yes. Let us spend a whole day of you apologizing and I'm sorry. <laughs> That's getting in the way of the work. And now, right. you. now you've made it about you. Well, I am, you know, I could talk to you all day. Right. Um, this has been so wonderful. Um, I have one more question that I, I think we can get to really quickly um, before closing. And then when you are done answering this question, if you can give folks a full introduction of you. I am happy to pull up one online, but I'd <laughs> I know you hate it. 
So I will let you tell people more about who Jason Reynolds is when we close. So last question for you. And um, I think it ties in perfectly to what we were just talking about, which is while doing anti-racist work in the classroom, how can I balance uplifting the voices of students of color in the classroom while also not asking them to perform emotional labor of sharing their experiences? Ooh, I think it's, I think, I, I think it's complicated. Um, uh, but I think it goes back to what Liz and Julie were saying about tokenizing, right? Yeah. You know, I think, I think if we, the question only, the reason that this question only exists is because of the fact that we're teaching uh, homogenized and monolithic versions of all the things, right? But if we were teaching, if we were teaching sort of, you know, more diverse, more versatile, more race conscious, more sort of broad ways of teaching our humanity and the people around us, then there's no reason to tokenize anybody because all of us right. being taught. Right, like if there's no reason to even ask a young black kid to, to sort of share their experiences, if we're if we're teaching, if we're teaching from a macro, if we're teaching totality, right, right, if we're trying to teach with you know, like if we're if we're, you know, I, I there's something that I people always talk about when it comes to um, uh, literature and te and black black literature especially. And, there's about black kids and it's about like where well, we don't want to show the trauma and the pain right like we want to we want to show you know, and i know julie mentioned this too and i and i and i get it I, i'm with that i also want to push back a tiny bit a tiny bit because i think i think the moment that we limit what we can teach them about black people whether it's good or bad whether it's whether it's something that's about the traumas that we've been through or about our joy i don't think we should limit it. i think we should teach all of it um, right Mm -hmm. because, because we are all of it. Langston Hughes yeah. said years ago that black people deserve to be both beautiful and ugly because we are, yeah. because we're human. I don't yeah. want to be propped up as a superhero. I don't want y'all to only show, you know, Serena Williams and Beyonce, right? And be like, yo, right. look at us, we killing them, we shining, right? Like, I don't, I don't yeah. want to go or, you know, First Lady Obama, Michelle Obama. Or, I don't want y'all to just show that, because yes, that is us, and also, um, we are all the other things too, because we're human mm -hmm. beings. And I think if we're teaching, the, 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 as, as we, to, to sort of end where we started, if we're teaching humanity, mm -hmm. right? if, we're, if we're teaching humanness, then I think if we do it right, we won't even need to tokenize any children. We won't have to, um, because, uh -huh. because, because the fabric work, the patchwork, the quilt uh, will be fully sewn. Love that. So who is, who is Jason Reynolds for, Anyone on, uh, anyone here at the convening who is not familiar with you and your work as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's hard for me to talk about me. I, I think ultimately I'll just say that I'm the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. I'm a novelist of 15 or so novels for young folks. Um, and I love, I love our kids, all of our kids, you know what I mean? Like, and, uh, and I've dedicated my life to making sure that they have um, books to read that reflect their lives as they live them as they live them currently to create a literary archive of themselves um, in the moment and also to be a voice and an advocate for them not to speak uh, not to speak for them but to speak with them um, and, and to engage with them and, and to stand alongside them as they sort of fight to push to make themselves known as human beings as not as children you know you asked me earlier Christine I didn't answer it you said what is something that kids say to you when you go to schools all the time they come to me and they say afterwards, yo, thank you so much for talking to us like people and not like kids. Uh, they are human beings. They are not half formed things. They are not, mm. uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're whole yeah. people. And I think they want adults to know that they're whole people. They don't know everything, but neither do you. Uh, right. and, and I think it's best that we engage with them uh, in, in that way. Jason, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Um, always a pleasure speaking with you. Um, just thank you again for taking time to speak to and empower educators, teaching professionals, librarians, parents, anyone who is here today. Thank you so much. Librarian. Wait, one last thing I want to say and I'm out. <laughs> Wait, just the last thing. There was, okay. there, there were people talking about uh, earlier, I think in Liz and Julie's session, there were questions about like, oh, how do we, um, how, how do we teach in sort of rural communities or how do we teach in, in communities that are conservative and they don't want to talk about these things. Uh, listen, 
find the librarian. Find the librarian. And here's the reason why. Librarians are the revolutionaries of your environments. Right? Librarians are the rebels. Because what the librarian understands more than anybody is that you don't have to agree with the thing for it to exist on the shelf. There are things mm -hmm. that librarians don't rock with, but they understand that every book deserves to live. So this is what you find the librarian and figure out how to get close to your librarian and use that as the model. You ain't got to agree with everything. That don't mean it's less true. Right. <laughs> that <don't mean> <laughs> that you still don't have an obligation to put it forth for our children to gain from, right? And I think yes. that's what librarians can teach you better than anybody else. Okay, I'm done. I'm Jason Reynolds. All right, I love it. Thank you so much, Jason. And we're, are, we're gonna take um, just a few minutes, um, just take a little break here, just for about five minutes. I know that we've all been sitting um, for, um, I, it doesn't really feel like we've been sitting since 11 o'clock, but many of us have. And so just want to take a moment to give people um, a moment to get up and stand, maybe go get some water, go to the restroom. And so join us back here in about five minutes. We will get started at 1.35 with our next session. We will be speaking with AU's own Dean of the um, School of Education, rather, um, Dr. Cheryl Hoka McCoy, as she discusses the importance of anti-racist teaching with our Assistant Vice President, um, Amanda Taylor. Dr. Amanda Taylor is um, the Assistant Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at AU. So we will see you in just a few moments. Thank you. If you're just joining us, please stand by. We are taking a short break um, and uh, we will be starting session two, the importance of anti-racist teaching at 1.35. Again, hello everyone. If you are just joining us and just able to join um, session two today, we are taking a short break and we'll be getting started at 1.35. Thank you.
Hi everyone, as we prepare um, for the next, next session, just want to make it very clear um, that this event is being recorded with the intention of making the recording available in due time. Um, for folks who are joining us via YouTube, we've updated the YouTube page with a list of resources um, in the description field. And so you may need to refresh your page for those changes to show up. So if you want to go ahead and do that, that would be great. We will be getting started again in one minute. Hello everyone and welcome back. Going to give folks a few moments to get situated um, and then we will be getting started here um, with our final session of the day, the importance of anti-racist teaching. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Hoka McCoy and Dr. Taylor. Are you here with us? Ah, there you are. Hi, can you all hear me okay? Got all you. Right. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, I am going to um, briefly read your bios um, to the audience and then I am going to let you both take it away. Um, Dr. Cheryl Hoka McCoy joined American University in 2016 as professor and dean of the School of Education. Prior to this role, Dr. Holcomb McCoy served as the vice provost for faculty affairs and vice dean of academic affairs and chair in the School of Education at John Hopkins University. She has held appointments as associate professor of counselor education at the University of Maryland College Park and assistant professor and director of the School of Counseling program at Brooklyn College um, of City University of New York. She is an award-winning um, educator and we are so proud and thankful to have you here today with us. And Dr. Amanda Taylor, um, where will I begin? Let's see here. Dr. Amanda Taylor, her research and teaching focuses on the intersection of culture, power, and education in domestic and international contexts. She earned her doctorate of education and her master's in education at Harvard University, where her dissertation focused on anti-racist educational policy implementation. Her research on anti-racist education and transnational and multicultural community organizing for educational justice has been published in top peer review journals and presses, including Harvard Educational Review, Oxford University Press, 
and the Peabody Journal of Education. Um, I know our attendees are super excited to hear about the important work that you're doing in the field of education, um, both on our campus and beyond. And so I will let you two take it from here and I look forward to joining you again for the Q&A. Great, well, thank, thank you, Christine. And I have to say, it's really hard following Jason Reynolds. I, mean, I know, I'm sorry. I fact to follow. I was so inspired by uh, your conversation with him and there's just so much to pick up on for us, but he said it all. I mean, he said um, all, a lot of what I think Amanda and I wanted to sort of have our session be about. And we were thinking we wanted to have this more of a conversation um, between the two of us and to give us a yeah. chance to interview each other. Um, yes. And so it's kind of fun to do this. We see each other on campus, but we never have this an opportunity to talk like this. So we hope everyone um, enjoys this time um, of hearing us talk. And then we thought we would leave about 30 minutes at the end uh, for Q&A because we really, really want to hear from the teachers and the educators out there. First of all, I want to say, Christine, that, I'm, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is that I am a former kindergarten teacher and first grade ah. teacher and an elementary school counselor, and I'm a parent because we haven't talked much about parenting and in this, in this time of remote learning, parents are doing even more teaching than they ever probably ever dreamed of. Yeah. So I'm coming with those hats on as well as a parent um, of two teenage children. Well, one is 20, so he's not a teenager <laughs> anymore. Um, and as um, a former educator, teacher, and counselor myself. So I just want to- well, Thank you. And I think parents will really enjoy hearing your perspective, especially as we are in this unprecedented time with virtual learning. And so any resources and tips that you have, I know they will love. I will be listening on the back end, learning, of course. Always enjoy talking to you and Dr. Taylor. So I look forward to learning more about you both in your work. Wonderful. And I'll turn it over to Amanda. I think she's going to do the first question. Sure. And before you go, thank you, Christine, for that, for that all too overdue intro. Um, and just, just want to also honor the incredible webinar so far. The participants have been just extraordinary. I'm so inspired and um, feel very much like Cheryl. I thought we could just drop the mic and walk out. It's been, um, <laughs> right, it's been said so brilliantly. Um, and, and I'm really, really honored to sort of be a part of this conversation. So thanks, Christine. Thank you both. Um, so yeah, I just want to, before we jump in, add to Cheryl's sort of more personal comments. I also very much identify as a classroom teacher. I started my career as a high school English teacher. So shout out to all the English teachers out there. Um, and I also taught abroad um, as well. So have a bit of that context in my background and also am a parent of um, two young folks who think they're teenagers, though are not yet teenagers. So I'm also wearing multiple hats here. And, and, and you know, Cheryl and I work together um, in lots of key ways. But one of the things that, that um, I've had the chance to do in addition to kind of teaching in the higher ed uh, context. So if anyone out there is a university level professor trying to figure out how, how do we sort of translate some of this really important work into higher ed, that's also something I think Cheryl and I both would be happy to talk about um, and brainstorm together about. And, and right now, you know, at AU, we're really working around what are the broader strategies and structures that we need to have as an institution to make sure that the, the weight of this work doesn't fall exclusively on classroom teachers, right? We know how powerful classroom teachers are. I mean, I, I think the magic happens in the classroom. I will never stray from that, that opinion. I think it's some of the most important work that happens. Um, in educational spaces full stop. Yet, how do we also recognize that there's all kinds of structures, policies, um, practices that are informing um, the classroom context? And how do we also work um, at all of those levels to make sure that we're really um, kind of doing systematic work towards, towards anti-racist education and schooling? So that's, that's another way that we're trying to move at AU um, through a broader plan and how I'm lucky enough to work with amazing partners like Cheryl and Christine and Malini and others at AU to together really work on shifting our entire institution. So with that, um, let, me, let me start, Cheryl, with some, some questions for you. I'm excited for this opportunity to talk together as, as, as you mentioned. So I'm curious, you know, anti-racism is one of those words 
that we talk about a lot now. It's become really popular. It wasn't as popular a term, um, you know, even in the recent past. And so I'm curious, you know, how, how, do you, how would you define anti-racism? What comes to your mind um, with that term? And why do you think it's so important for educators? You know, why is it something that you focused on so much uh, in the School of Education? Yeah, well, first, in the spirit of anti-racism, um, in defining it, it really is all about action and changing behaviors. And in the spirit of that, I just want to make an, acknowledge an, an acknowledgement now that, you know, in Washington, D.C., we are on the traditional territory of the Nacotchtank and the Anacosta and the Piscataway people. And in the School of Education, we acknowledge this legacy and we find inspiration um, from this history and the acknowledge in the legacy from the land. Um, this is one of our new practices that we're doing that is a part of our anti-racist vision for the school. And that is, again, changing and eliminating racism by changing systems and organizational structures, our policies and our practices so that the decision-making and the power differential or is redistrib redistributed in some way. Um, and shared across all racial groups. And um, that's how we see, I see anti-racism. It is more of um, a mind shift, um, if you will, as well as a way in which we behave. It, it shifts our thinking about how we've normally done things and changing and shifting. Um, I think it was Jason that just said something about, you know, um, it's about um, sort of this, this note, when we think about anti-racism in this work, it, we've been talking about culturally responsive teaching for a long time in, in isolation, but not talking about redistributing the power back to our children. And, and he said he was talking about 16 year olds, um, you know, are giving him some of the answers to what we might need to do in education. And I think he was absolutely right about that. It is sort of looking at um, what I call the unusual suspects in education and actually really listening to what um, our students are saying and then rethinking, restructuring our practices in the classroom. And as I talk more about this, I could talk a long time about what we're doing in the School of Education and I'll talk about that a little later. But one of the things that's been really powerful for us is to listen to our students. Our black and brown students came to us this summer after the killing of George Floyd with real concerns about how we were addressing issues around racial injustice in the classroom and in our curriculum. So this summer, we have taken a real, a real positive step um, to really look at our curriculum and how we're training teachers and educators and centering the curriculum, not around whiteness, but around authors who are talking about um, critical race theory um, and Afrocentric pedagogy. Um, and this is literature that's been around for a long time, but we are centering ourselves on the voices of others um, and listening very carefully to what our students are coming to us with. So this is just this practice of anti-racism is really about um, changing the mind shift from where we are centered in our new knowledge, how we're training, how we're doing everything and, and our policies and practices, which is the harder piece to change because it takes institutional will um, from our faculty, our staff and the School of Ed to really see that shift. But we, call, we think we're modeling, we are modeling this for our students because when they become teachers and educators and leaders in the field, we want them to take the same approach. So it's an active pro an approach, and it's changing how we think about our work and our practice. How do you see it? I mean, what, is, what has been your experience from, you know, from looking at the university, possibly? Do you see it as being somewhat of the same? I do, and I, I, think, I think you really hit on it, Cheryl, and, and I think all the panelists have, is, is really anti-racism is about action, right? It is about the outcomes of what we do. And, and really analyzing those critically and, and looking at um, examples of inequity, right? So I think another key anti-racist um, move is to make sure that anytime we as educators, as school leaders in any form, um, as school-based folks in any form, when we see racial disparities, that we are sure that we recognize and understand those are problems of policy, right? Those are problems of systems. Those are not problems of people, right? Um, and I think that is a key anti-racist commitment 
So that means something is wrong with how we're structuring the system, right? If we see disparities in discipline, for example, right? Um, if we see disparities in who is getting recommended to gifted and talented programs and who's not, and who's overrepresented in special education, um, and who's underrepresented in special education, what are the subtle policies and practices and decisions that are being made at every level of the educational institution that produces those results, right? And how do we really commit at every level to dismantling um, those practices, structures, and policies and examining, examining them um, with a lens towards, towards actually rebuilding a more just system. So I think that that's really how I understand anti-racism. And I think um, it's super important, I think, especially, I love that Jason opened the conversation around white folks, right? Um, and, you know, I'm a white woman. And a lot of times people are like, what, you know, why did you get into this, right? What are you doing in this work? And I think um, it's actually super, super important for, for me and for all of us, I think, to remember that anti-racism can't be a badge, especially right now when a lot of white folks were feeling like, I need to make sure I'm seen as an anti-racist, right? I think we need to be really, really careful that um, we are not doing superficial work. Right, we're trying. We're not just learning how to say the right things, right, or put the right things on our social media feeds, or put the right posters up in our classrooms or on our walls, right. But we're really doing what I think Liz and Julie were talking about, which is the deep internal work to say how do we actually honor and own the fact that we all live in and through systems of white supremacy. We have all been, and we continue to be, um, raised and uh, in, and we're swimming in a system that reinforces whiteness all the time, right. And so, how do we actually um, accept that and then actively work um, to dismantle it in our own um, understandings and ideas and practices um, at every level. So, you know, that means that it's not, we can't just be nice, right? We can't just think yeah, we that we're can't. good people, right? And that things are going to change um, because that's not how racism operates. Um, it yeah. operates through these systems and structures. Yeah, I think it was Jason that just said too that we can't Taught, we can't read ourselves into being an anti-racist, right? We can join book clubs are helpful for the knowledge piece. Um, there's also that self-interrogation piece, you know, so it's, it's, it's good for us to be knowledgeable about others and the history of oppression, history of racism um, in this country. It's also important for us to do some of this, I, we call it self-interrogation work, um, where we are asking ourselves these critical questions and being, I think he talked about um, having thick skin, being able to hear others' critique of how maybe we have blinders or blind spots. But then is that piece of taking that and actually doing something in the classroom to change the system. And so that is the real, you know, that is the piece around anti-racism is that is so important. You know, I just want to talk a little bit too, because, you know, when you were saying, you know, about policies around uh, special education, um, gifted and talented, who's in college, you know, um, prep courses, all of these decisions that are made in education all the time about who's in and who's out, right? Who are those kids that are being validated for success in the future and those that are not? And we know that there is a racial imbalance there of who is considered valuable and who are the dispensable ones. Um, that anti-racism really does examine that power imbalance, right? Looking at the who is making those decisions and what are they making those decisions based upon? Because um, this plays out, I call it the unearned privileges that happen all over the place in education and schools um, that most of the time white people benefit from and racialized people do not. Um, this summer we had um, a real call to action for um, school counselors uh, coming out of, out of our Center for Post-Secondary Readiness and Success. And um, we're looking at ways in which school counselors sit in a very powerful position about making determinations about scheduling where students, what classes they should be in, um, what they're told that they're capable of. I remember hearing um, certain students aren't college material. Um, what does that really mean, you know? And, you know, Bettina Love talks about, um, you know, spirit murdering, you know, mm -hmm. that counselors are often in positions to really kill the dreams and murder the dreams of uh, many of our students um, and typically are of racialized people. How do we stop and disrupt, not just disrupt it, but stop that? 
Um, that's real anti-racist education work, right? Um, to be the one to stand up and say, no, we are not going to do this anymore. And so this summer, we had just a spirited conversation with with school counselors and school counselor educators around how do we train school counselors to be anti-racist? How do we stop these systems of determining, um, you know, these classes of students? Um, and if we're looking at standardized testing, which we already know the research shows us, it doesn't, it's not necessarily predictive of um, college success. Um, all of these pieces around that process that um, could be corrected. And school counselors standing up and saying, yes, we want to correct this and we want to change our practice. We want to change these policies. Um, that's really powerful. Um, and so anti-racism around um, these practices in education, you know, it's not just teachers. Teachers, surely, but there are other educators in the building too. Um, the other piece, you know, I say we, we have anti-racist teachers that are ready to go, but you know, they can be constrained if we have leaders and school leaders that aren't with them. And so um, we are also, we have an anti-racist school leadership program in which we are really taking to task some of these standards of, of practice for school leaders and thinking about policy change. How do you do that within a school? What are the steps that um, some of our school leaders need to take to ensure that anti-racist teachers can do this work and that we're, we really are changing the systems um, and the structures to ensure that we have success. So it's really exciting work. Um, and although the summer has been tough, um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we are in a different place um, in education where we are bringing more people to the table. I think I was telling Chris, Christine, like a thousand or some people are ready to have a talk about anti-racism when 20 years ago, when you say anti-racism, it might have been perceived as negative. Mm -hmm. And here we are having a conversation and we can say Black Lives Matter and people get it and they under, they're coming to the table to talk about that. So I'm encouraged, but there's a whole lot of work to do. Yeah, Cheryl, I, I love so much about what you're saying. And I think that the idea that we have all these educators, um, including counselors, including, you know, principals and, and others, you know, uh, paraprofessionals and others, all who are um, educators and parents who are also educators, really um, clamoring for this kind of information, especially at a moment when just doing the quote unquote regular work of education is so much more complex, right? Navigating, are we going back hybrid? Are we going back online? What does that look like? How am I gonna do that work? Um, I think we have a key opportunity here to think about how do we come back differently, right? Yeah. How do we, because what I heard you talking about, Cheryl, is, is that part of key to anti-racism is, is stopping um, some of the practices and policies that have been normalized, right? That we've, we've come to treat as normal and regular. Mm -hmm. um, for example, who and how do we recommend folks for gifted programs? Who and how do we recommend to top colleges as school counselors, right? How do, who and how, um, what kinds of parents uh, and caregivers are welcomed in to um, the school leader's office or, or are active in, in the PTA? And, and what kinds of parents are not, right? Or are shut down or are silenced um, or not met? Um, with, with answers uh, to, their, to their questions, right? And so it's really about taking that time to stop, step back, and work to actually rebuild, I think, our systems and structures in ways that are anti-racist. We have an opportunity right now, as we pause, as we rethink, as we redo, to really focus on what matters most. Um, and so, you know, one thing you and I were talking about, Cheryl, uh, is, is this new kind of online and virtual context that we're, we're going to be moving into, right? And, it ha and I saw some of the questions coming up from uh, educators on this uh, webinar so far, is how do we think about um, both challenges and opportunities for anti-racist uh, educational practice in this virtual world that we're in now and that we're going to certainly um, be in in some form or another uh, throughout the fall and probably longer. What are some, what are some opportunities and challenges that you see? Um, in the virtual space? Well, I think we, you know, we have to be really, really careful um, not to fall back in the traps of creating um, systems for inequities, right? Um, it's really easy for us to fall back 
into um, practices that will, again, um, se separate, divide, sort students um, um, just by the fact that, you know, we have some communities without Wi-Fi. Um, and I've said for years, we need universal Wi-Fi. Here we are um, at a time when, you know, that has become a major issue. Um, students in rural areas and some parts of our own city. I mean, here in DC, we have pockets of areas that do not have um, stable Wi-Fi um, access for its residents. And um, so, you know, one thing that this shift to remote learning has done, it has just highlighted the already, the inequities that were already there, right? Um, that we knew about. Um, and so to be careful that we're not exacerbating those inequities, right? Um, I think we have to be very careful about um, what we're doing um, in and, and, and education. Just as an example, um, you know, on university campuses, you know, we're talking about, um, students having policies around having to show your face on a Zoom call, right? Um, just yesterday, we were talking with a group of high school students and making this assumption that students want you to see them and where they are um, is also normalizing a behavior that no one is, why, why is that important? I mean, we have to ask ourselves, is that fair to all students? Um, and so, you know, questioning um, our decisions that we're making around remote learning is so important right now so that we're not um, falling back to where we've been. Um, you know, I was telling a group of, um, of our students the other day, you know, even using the language of, I can't wait to get back to normal. I mean, we don't wanna go back to normal. Normal for us in education were wide education disparities based mm -hmm. on race. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to go back there. So this is a chance for us to, to be creative and innovative and take advantage of this time um, to think about how we can create more equity, increase equity at this juncture. Um, access right now, I mean, technology can be an enemy when we're talking about not everyone having access to Wi-Fi, but it can also be a, a blessing in a sense that we have, we can, we can have larger classes, we can open it up and have more access um, by diverse populations to what we're doing. So, but we have to think through that and be very conscious about and intentional um, about what we're deciding to do. So the policies around remote learning, I would say that we need to be very thoughtful that we're not falling back um, and going back to normal. We don't wanna go back to normal. This is our opportunity to, to do more, right? Um, I think that's the way we need to look at this, um, this moment. Um, we're also, you know, we're at a point too where, you know, students are telling us that they're hurting. Um, and I know Amanda, you know a lot, of, we've talked about this, that um, many of our black and brown students given um, the highlighted racial injustices that have happened over the summer, the racialized killings at the hands of police, the people who are right, who are there to protect are not protecting you and your community. Um, the hurt and the pain, right? Um, it's also a time for us, even remotely, to acknowledge the lived experiences of our students and to acknowledge the pain um, that some students are going through. Uh, the amount of loss that COVID-19 has caused and disproportionately in black and brown communities, um, the grief and the loss, um, we have to acknowledge that in schools and as educators acknowledge that. Um, even if we haven't experienced it, if one has not experienced it in their own lives, they have to acknowledge that it is happening. Um, and so, and I think, you know, Jason said to, you know, I was listening as he was saying, and I was like, amen, yes, I agree, that we have to acknowledge the pain and embrace the joy, right? We can't ignore one or the other, right? Because for many of us, we're living the pain and then we've, we're finding places of joy, right? Um, that's how we are surviving. We want to thrive. But so to thrive, I believe it's important for us to acknowledge the pain. And we have to, now we're having to do that remotely. Um, so in order for us not to um, fall into some of these traps of inequities, we have to have that acknowledgement of the different diverse lived experiences of our students. I think that is key for educators to take the time you love your students, take the time to acknowledge them um, and to love them as unique individuals.
I think that's right. And, and so much about, um, you know, we've heard folks talking on this call, I know Liz and Julie too, were talking about trauma-informed pedagogy, right, as really important towards anti-racism right now in this moment. Um, I also though, think about our, our teachers, our, our school leaders, right, our paraprofessionals, um, especially black, black and brown folks, indigenous folks, right, who are, who are themselves grappling right, with the, the racialized disproportionate impact of COVID-19 maybe in their lives, family, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And so, so I also wanna encourage, you know, school leaders to think about how to create um, really a strong affinity spaces um, for educators of color, for black and brown educators to sort of come together and be in community and find that joy. That's something we're experimenting with. Um, you know, I know you're doing it at School of Ed and also at AU more broadly. Um, to, to find um, spaces for recharging, right? To find spaces for um, being in community um, in a way that fills, fills folks up, right? And, and, and helps uh, create space so teachers and school leaders can bring themselves um, fully to their students and to the families that they work with. So I think that's another important thing for us to really think about and a strategy to use. Um, you know, I think one, oh, go ahead, Cheryl. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, this whole notion of, you know, we talk about the students are traumatized um, and, um, but they're educators that are traumatized as well. Um, I have to say this summer, you know, and, you know, the, the trauma of watching a man be killed on, the, you know, um, to see the, the film, the video of George Floyd's murder and to hear about Breonna Taylor's the end of her life and hearing that over and over again um, to many people who look like Breonna who have cousins and uncles and fathers that look like George Floyd um, it was traumatizing and for many you know this was the first time they you know witnessed this type of um, activity in communities for others, it was just a reminder of something that they're seeing every day and further traumatized to see it um, on the public stage. And I think we have, going back to this acknowledgement, I mean, for us in the School of Ed, as a part of our anti-racism work, we decided to get black and brown faculty together if we found a space for them to have these conversations because they were trying to help students, but they were traumatized as well. Um, so this work around anti-racism as we talk about you know, what our white faculty and teachers and educators are going through, black teacher, black and brown teachers and educators are also um, experiencing their own um, trauma, if you will, with these experiences and what they're watching. And so there is this need to address the students and the educators in this process. Um, and for leaders such as, you know, myself and uh, education leaders, school leaders, district uh, leaders, understanding that and, and, and creating spaces, as you said, I think is really, really important. And they don't have to be called safe spaces. That's another thing. I, I, I love that. Because it, these are just spaces for people who can, they can talk to others who have similar experiences. They're not necessarily safe in the sense that they're, you know, you're, they're safe in the sense that you feel that the people there might, you know, relate in the same way. But it's a way of, I call it healing spaces. It's a place for you to heal um, so that you can become strong again to, um, to go about your work and to continue with your life. Um, that healing has to happen for all of us, but in different ways. It's just in different ways. That's right. Um, and I think, you know, one of the practices that I think is, is really powerful in K-12 education and increasingly in higher ed, and we're, we're trying it at AU2, is practices around uh, restorative practices, right? Um, right. They, they, how do we sort of restore our communities, right? Because we have, we have institutional trauma too, right? We have, it, it's at every level. So, so what does restoration look like? And how do we rebuild the, the kinds of rich relationships um, that we need where we can see each other and be seen as full and whole and in all of our identities and all of our lived experiences, right? Um, and so I think restorative practices can be really key here. There's some great um, work 
um, and, and great free opportunities for webinars for restorative practices, which can be kind of proactive ways to rebuild communities and to build community fabric and then restorative justice practices, which are also ways to kind of respond to harm, respond to trauma, respond to conflict. They've also increasingly being used to um, as ways to disrupt school to prison pipelines and problematic uh, disproportionate um, you know, suspension and disciplinary rates for black and brown youth. Um, so I think that's another really key practice um, Amanda, within schools. Amanda, I'm just curious, because you've done a, an extensive, a lot of work around restorative justice. How, what has your experience been in bringing in restorative justice programs into education settings that are so accustomed to a very traditional, um, you know, discipline, very punitive type of uh, policy. How, how, what has that been like? I mean, what, what would you say is important to do as an educator um, to get started with that kind of a program? It's a good question. I will be honest. I'm a learner in restorative justice um, to myself, and, and I have great colleagues who are far more expert than I am um, in this work. You know, in DC, I know there's a restorative justice collaborative of educators. Um, there are some wonderful restorative justice schools. There's some great resources out there. So I want to name that first. Um, but so we're, we're trying it, you know, at AU. And I will tell you, um, I have seen both the power and the challenge, just from my perspective so far, of these kinds of practices. I think the power is that uh, truly restorative models um, have commitments to community in a way that is expansive. And they're fundamentally humanizing, right? They, they demand that we are all fully ourselves all the time. Um, and they, they try to both recognize but decenter power relationships, right? So even the practice of sitting in a circle, right? And having a talking stick, which is sort of uh, just a practice around restorative justice is really about um, kind of how do we physically, and this is trickier to do in online context, right? We can come up with some, some mechanisms that are like that, but how do we actually um, reshift power, rebalance power, share um, space, right? Hold space for everyone, even if what they want to do is pass. You've still held space for folks to, for folks' voices to be heard. Um, and they demand we all show up as all of who we are in all of, um, all of the things that make us wonderful and terrible and hum fully human, right? And so I think that's really the, the promise of it. And it's a commitment to um, true accountability to each other, true accountability to a community, which is to say that the solutions um, derive from the circle, right? Restorative justice practices are based in indigenous um, practices. Um, they've also been used extensively throughout um, uh, Africa, in particular, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. They've been really powerful abroad too, but also have a deep history um, around the world. And, and I think, again, this commitment to each other uh, in community is really the promise. I think the challenge is that um, it's, it's very, especially in the U.S., very contrary to our punitive, individualistic, um, punish and excise culture that, that we have that has led to things like mass incarceration, that has led to things like um, the idea of expelling students, right, as opposed to really um, working with conflicts, seeing conflict as an opportunity to transform and get better and for us all to kind of heal and to figure out together what it means to truly be accountable for our actions, right? To sit in conversation with those who we've harmed um, and to hear that and to hold that and to figure out together um, what justice looks like um, in that moment. So I think it's very countercultural in the U.S. context is what I'll say. Um, and so that's part of the challenge is, is really um, how do we shift the way that we come to think about ourselves as a community mm -hmm. so that those kinds of practices can be um, taken up more broadly. Yeah, and it's recent, you know, if you think about who has benefited from the old, the other system, the, the old system of the way we see justice, again, we go back to this notion, it's, it, it really does sit in our history of oppression and how our justice systems have held up um, some of these of our other um, you know oppressive systems and so um, it's letting go of that right that is sometimes really hard for the institution to let go of um, because those who benefited possibly by it will somehow be um, in a different position um, that positionality changes so that's um, it's really powerful, the restorative justice work, but it's also, um, like you said, it is um, 
it's re it's not just rethinking it's more than rethinking it is redoing um, a, a system that we've become so accustomed to, which is a part of the, fa is the fabric of our being um, in our society. That's really exciting work. Um, and um, there's a lot going on with that. We have been um, working with our law school. I mentioned earlier, I think I, I put in the chat room about our Summer Institute on Education, Equity and Justice um, in our school, the American University. Um, we call it SIEGE. Um, Summer Institute for Education, Equity, and Justice um, was in collaboration as education, the law school, and the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center because we envisioned that we need to do more with people who study law and justice. Um, and we have some fantastic faculty in the law school in the Washington College of Law who um, are part of our SIEGE community <clears throat> and have helped us really rethink um, some of the work that we're doing in schools around restorative justice. I think the Marshall Brennan Center, um, they're, they're doing exciting work. And it's that collaboration, you know, educators say, well, where do I start? You know, and I said, you know, it's good that educators talk to educators. It's good because we're like preaching to the choir, you know, and I think someone said earlier, Jason might've said this to, you know, change the song or you gotta go to choir re rehearsal, you gotta change up some. And so for us in education, I think it's so imperative for us to talk to others in different fields, right? Because education is at the core and we, we call, you know, education is one of, I call it's a social determinant of everything else. It's a social determinant of health. There's a direct link between health and education. There's a direct link between our justice system and education system. Um, and so sometimes when we, as educators, we can go to others for resources um, and for assistance. And so developing a restorative justice program, if you have a local law school or, you know, there might be faculty there that might be willing to come over and help in your school or your school district, um, start rethinking um, your discipline policies to look more like a restorative justice system. Um, I have found a lot of energy from um, those, I call them unsuspect, unusual suspects, um, people in other fields that are just as interested and passionate about um, anti-racist work. And they're doing the work just in a different discipline, but it's so related, so related. Yeah, I think that's right, Cheryl. And I'll say one last thing. I see Christine on here because I think it's time for Q&A. Um, we could run our mouths all day, Cheryl, um, but I think important <laughs> when we get to the group. Um, but I think the one last thing that, that I'd like to say to your point is, you know, where do we find support in this work, right? You're talking about kind of going um, even beyond educators, looking at, you know, um, what are ways to build partnerships, right, with with other institutions, uh, nonprofit organizations that might be in the area? I also want to say it's really key. There are networks of educators doing this. So if you're out there on this webinar and thinking, I want to do this work, but I don't feel like I have anyone else around me, right, in my school, I maybe don't have a school leader who who I feel like um, is in support of this work. How do I get started? What do I do? know that there are networks out there of educators across institutions um, who are incredible and really willing um, and eager to connect you to others, right? So the Education for Liberation Network is, is one, um, I think, incredible resource. Also know that as teachers, you have a lot of power to organize and mobilize together. Um, and, and I think also know that there are, I've done some, some amazing, um, and powerful research on this with, with many others around looking at community organizations too that are actually really interested in education. Mm -hmm. How do you mobilize families, communities to push for educational policy change and young people um, as key leaders of that work? So I think there are resources and networks within schools, but also across institutions and within communities that we can all leverage to push for change. Yeah, and, and you know, and we could talk about parents, empowering parents right. um, to mobilize and to create school change and to do the anti-racist work. I think parents are critical partners in this work that we're doing. So to create community um, change around anti-racist efforts stemming from schools and educators, I think is very, very powerful. So I'll end it right there and maybe others, maybe some folks have questions about that, but um, we'll end it right there because we know we want to leave at least 30 minutes for um, Q&A. So we'll turn it over to Christine. Yes. Yes, and um, I love that you mentioned community organizations, um, both, for, both for educators and for parents. 
I'm just thinking of Teaching for Change, who is just, they're just wonderful um, for educators, City Bridge here in DC, wonderful. Um, so yeah, there are a number of just wonderful resources where educators and parents don't have to feel that they're alone in this work. Um, I want to jump into a few questions from the audience. Um, this first question is for you, Amanda. Um, my question, Dr. Taylor, based on your statement is that it's not about people, but about policies. Don't people make the policies? Mm. So I'd love for you to address yes, this. Yes, I love this question. I, I do love this question. <laughs> I you would. I know, I love, and, and Cheryl, I'd love to hear you in on this too, and maybe you, Christine, too. Um, I love this question, and I think yes and no would be my answer, right? Um, okay. So people enforce policies um, and people um, also make policies, but policies also exist um, from history, right? Um, so so there's, a multi there's a sort of a multiplier effect, right? So, so often, this is very important as we understand our work as anti-racist uh, educators is to say, um, we need to recognize that we are embedded in systems and structures where racism can happen and will continue to happen without the active intention or work of any individual people in a system, right? Mm. Um, so racism without racist is, is a, um, a, a Bonilla Silva's work, which is really incredible. So how does that happen? That individual actors might not be doing anything actively um, to sustain right. racism, but that racism is self, itself is sustained. Right? So that happens because of historical policies. That happens because of norms that we've all come to agree upon and accept as standard or as appropriate or the, just the way we do things here. Right? So sometimes it's, it's policy and sometimes it's practice and norms and behavior. So for example, you could think about, um, well, this is just how we recommend people for, for gifted and talented. Parents can write in, right? And um, and counselors maybe make a recommendation. That's just how we do it. All I'm doing is following the system, the rules. Yeah. right? Um, so is anyone actively um, withholding opportunity from, from young folks for, for getting um, you know, recommended to, to gifted and talented programs, especially black and brown young folks, who we know are equally gifted and talented as anyone else in the world, right? Um, not necessarily, but it could be that the systems and the normal, normalized procedures and practices themselves have been built to exclude and marginalize. So just by doing things the regular way, we result in sort of racist uh, outcomes for folks. The only thing I would add to that is that, and I, I, I like to think of it not as either or, but as and, yeah. you know, policies and people. Um, but I do think, you know, borrowing from our colleague, um, Ibram Kendi, who talked about racist ideas are generated by people, and then the policies follow the ideas, right? So as long as we have people who are ascribing to racist ideas about, you know, um, you know about anything about who should be in gifted and talented programs or who should be identified as a college goer or whatever. The policies follow those ideas. And mm. so we build policies around these ideas that we have about people. So I would say that people in many ways drive the policies, right? So, you know, and I agree with Amanda that if we could change the policies, then we, you know, it would be a better, you know, we would have more likelihood of a anti-racist, um, world. Um, but, you know, these racist ideas about, especially in education, are driven by these, you know, by people who, for whatever reason, because of our history of oppression, the anti-Black sentiment, Black and Brown sentiment in our country, these ideas sort of um, link to these policies in a very direct way. Um, right. So that's, um, that, you know, so it is, um, it's sort of the chicken or the egg kind of thing. Which one comes first? Um, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of up in the air, but I think it's a and for me. I think both are just as important. I would hate to have Thank to choose one or the other, but I don't think you can look at anti-racist work without looking at policies. I mean, that's a necessity. And I think, and I think it's important for educators and all of us to remember policies happen at multiple levels in education, right? 
there are sort of district level policies, national policies, right? Mm -hmm. School level policies, but there's also uh, department policies and classroom policies. Right. Um, educators themselves have a lot of power um, to set and reset classroom policy, right? Around late work, right? What, what does late work mean? What do you do about that? For example, often that is your decision, right? Um, who do you call on and why? These are micro political, micro policy decisions that all educators are empowered to um, to make. So I think it, uh, I very much agree it's a both and, and recognizing that depending on where we sit and what our roles are in an educational system, we have different opportunities to, um, um, to kind of intervene and work on anti-racist policy action. Love that, love that. Um, Amanda, another question um, for you. Um, this attendee said, I agree that self-examination is a necessary step in the conversation. How can I convince a school of mostly white people, both students and faculty, who think that racism is not a problem to mm -hmm. begin that process? Oftentimes, you know, there's no racism here, so we don't have a problem, so we don't need to talk about it. I know, right? That is, that is, that's whiteness in action. You know, as, as white folks, we've, we've um, been miseducated to believe that race and racism are problems for people of color, when in fact, racism is our problem, right, mm -hmm. as white folks. Right? I think we often have been miseducated to believe that race is only present when people of color are in the room. Mm. Right? And I think it's, it's, a major, um, it's a major mistake in our thinking because whiteness um, right, is a racialized category. Right? It is, is not one that we talk about. Right? But the power and privilege that, it, that, that is embedded in whiteness is there all of the time. Right? Even when people of color are not present. So even when you're an all white school, racism is operational. Um, it matters. It's, it's playing itself out. So um, one thing I might suggest, there's a really great resource and it's, it's kind of an older book. I actually have it here on my shelf. I love it. Um, it's called Despite the Best Intentions. It's by Amanda mm -hmm. Lewis and John Diamond. Um, I can pop it in the, the chat as a resource, but it's about how racial inequality thrives in good schools. It's a really powerful ethnography where they're, they're really sort of cataloging all of the ways that, what, um, that they show in really a good school that doesn't have any quote unquote racial problems, mm -hmm. in fact, has all kinds of mechanisms that are sustaining racial inequality. Um, and, and so I would suggest that as maybe a, a book to start reading together or a resource to share. Um, it's really concrete and, and practical. So that might be one way to get the conversation started. Thank you, thank you. And again, that book is called Despite the Best Intentions. Right. Um, Cheryl, Dr. Well, not Cheryl, Dr. Hoka McCoy. Oh, <laughs> Do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? No, I mean, I think, you know, uh, I think, you know, Amanda's um, uh, response was uh, drop the mic response. I mean, it's nothing I can add. You know, I just think is it is this, um, this notion that racism only occurs when people of color are around is a myth um, mm -hmm. because we live within a racialized society. So it's all around us, no matter the composition of the neighborhood of the community, it's there. Um, and I think, you know, if we just look at demographics, um, our country is becoming more and more racially diverse. And so the chances of you living in an area or go to a school where there are no people of color then the chances are becoming mighty slim um, mm -hmm. that that will be your reality. And I think um, that, so we need to grapple with these issues so that we can um, just have a better society all in general. I mean, it doesn't matter who is in your school. The other thing that, you know, from an education standpoint, I just want to put this in there is that, you know, in schools though, we're seeing a real decrease in the number of teachers and educators of color in general um, mm -hmm. over the years. And I think that this is another topic we could have another webinar on, but there's several reasons for that. There's a history related to, you know, after Brown versus Board of Education, what happened to black educators, okay. um, black and brown educators. That could be its own webinar. There you go. We could do that next. Um, but I think, you know, one of the, um, uh, you know, the results of that is that we're seeing fewer and fewer students, uh, college students, looking at careers in education. And one mm. of the things that, you know, I am most passionate and most proud of here at, at AU is our teacher pipeline project, 
with the District of Columbia Public Schools. Yes. And the entire, you know, the reason why we're doing this program is that we believe to be anti-racist, that our students have to see teachers and leaders that look like them, um, yes. that are anti-racist um, in their approach. Um, but we also, are, we, are, we are bringing DCPS or DC students, high school students to campus to explore how education is related to everything else that we do in our world. And it's just giving them an opportunity to explore and discuss issues of inequity in education. And we feel that the more that students are empowered to understand what we're talking about today, they will be better parents. They'll possibly even become a teacher and yeah. a leader. Well, that would be great. And we think that in DC, for instance, we need to see more teachers that understand the communities, the diverse communities in the city. And so um, it's empowering um, to empower residents of DC to become teachers in the district and to lead and to have voice. And um, so I'm just really proud of that because that to me is a statement about our anti-racist approach. Yes, yes. And there's a one. Oh, and one sorry. thing I'll add, no, and one thing I want to add to that work and that, that is so powerful um, that you're leading, Cheryl, I think is we also know that students of color perform better with teachers of color. And there's increasing evidence that even white students perform better with teachers of color. There's right? a new study that just came out about that. Yes. So there, yeah. there's some amazing work here. Studies that show that now. So, I mean, there's evidence. It's just not one study. There's several yeah. studies that show that. Right. right. So I think, and we said we start in, in, in higher education too. Right. So, so this is again, I think important to the, the original question of, you know, sort of what's in it for white folks, right? Why should white folks deal with mm -hmm. this? It's better for all kids. And I, I think right. anti-racism is for all of us. And that's very important as a message. Um, and if you need to kind of um, really make that more of a point with any colleagues, I think it's important for us to say, uh, you know, if we don't, as white folks, learn about whiteness and start to dismantle um, the problematic and partial um, learning that we've gotten about ourselves, the risk for our children is incredibly high. Do you want your child to be the next white police officer with his knee on the neck of a black right. man for eight minutes? Is that what you want right. for your child? Is that what right. is that the kind of people we want to put into this world that those ideas that that make that seem reasonable? You know, right. if, if that's not what we want, we have got to do the work, right? right. As white folks and with, with young white, white children. I mean, this is crucial for us. So I think our young people know that too. So it's, yeah. it's again, listening to them and, and really yeah. creating space for these conversations, even in all white space and especially in all white spaces. So I'm gonna, this next question, I'm gonna um, direct to you, Dr. Um, Hoka McCoy, because you did touch on a little bit about the mental health um, of students. So um, an attendee says, in this moment of the pandemic as educators are distance learning, I worry about the mental health of our students and re-triggering trauma that students have experienced without being able to give the proper time and attention. We have such limited time and capacity for discussions that require the attention and time they need. How do we incorporate racial discussions and lessons while being fully supportive to students' mental health when our interactions through Zoom or Google Classroom is so limited? I want to continue topics of race, but worry students won't get the opportunity for discussion in the same way that they would in an in-person format. Yeah, I worry about that too. So, you know, I think, I believe uh, the, the audience member is absolutely right um, th to be concerned. And I think we have to take those concerns to our leaders. Um, um, as we talk about structures and policies, I think that um, creating the time um, for these discussions um, is really important. So as we are revamping um, you know, how we're reopening schools, we should be pushing for, and this is where the community advocacy and parents and teachers coming together to push for new policies where students are given in the day that is constructed, that there is time for some type of an advisory or time for students to just mm -hmm. check in with a caring adult in the school. It could be a counselor, it could be a teacher, it could be someone, it could be just with your peers to have that space, I think is so important. Um, and then I think, you know, for, you know, in our training to, you know, to get online, I think that it's important for 
for districts to think about how are we training teachers to have these conversations remotely, right? Um, mm -hmm. There is, uh, you know, there's some, there's some, you know, a little bit of skill related to this, you know, how do you have these conversations, maybe even personal conferences with each of your students, if you have that time, if you have, if you can build that in, I think is so important to meet with each student for at least 15 minutes just to check in individually, possibly. Um, that those kinds of practices in person and online really do help. Um, I, I worry too about the mental health of students. Um, and, you know, we're still thinking through how to do remote or what we call telecounseling, you know, um, mm -hmm. counseling remotely or through an online server or whatever. Um, those, there's some interesting practices that are out there and people are really, um, looking at ways in which we can do that and maintain confidentiality. Um, mm -hmm. So that's out there. But I think the beginning is the concern and then advocating for um, more services um, that are there for students. Also helping parents. Um, one of the things that you know I've been really looking into recently is helping parents knowing how to talk to their children in ways that is helpful to them as they are struggling with um, possible. And when I say mental health, it, it can be normal developmental issues that most students go through. Um, but with isolation, it could possibly be even more. So we have to have help parents also know how to look for signs of, you know, maybe I need to go to a professional, or maybe I can do this, I can spend an extra 20 minutes with my daughter. I think you said, Christine, you know, you have two good hours with your daughter, right? Yeah. I mean, you actually took the time to think about how much time am I spending with my child? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so those are, those are things that we can talk to parents about. And parents too, I mean, th let's not forget the other pandemic that we have an economic issue. You know, we have, we're looking squarely at an economic crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Where people are losing jobs every day. So parents, are stressed out. Parents also need the mental health support in addition to um, the students. So these are trying times and we are, you know, in many ways trying to develop new practices. But to your, the audience um, member out there, I, I share your concerns and I think, you know, the very the minimal we can do is to advocate very strongly for services in our school districts and the time um, to make time for our students, to just go ahead and make time. I had some faculty members that said, should I, do I keep going with my syllabus? Or, you know, the students are said they're not okay. What should I do? I was like, take time and talk to them. Right, I mean, right. It's, okay. it's, you know, I, you know, just forget what you, you know, you can get to that, but they can't even talk about what you want them to talk about until they have that time to, to get themselves ready to learn, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it's just making the time, just do it. Thank Can you. I add one thing there that, that sure. might be a, a concrete um, practice to add on to what Cheryl's describing? I think I heard, I read something, some there was, it was, I thought really powerful, talked about Marie condoing your syllabus, which is, right? I and I, Christine, I know you'll like you this, know, I I all this out there, I know, but right. But the idea of really thinking about sometimes as educators, um, both higher ed and K-12, we try to, we try to cover content, right? We, mm. You're very focused on covering content. My concrete suggestion is that we actually focus on fewer things um, and going deeper with those things, mm. right? But I, so, so kind of really figuring out what are the key um, sort of content areas that you need to get across because the relational work, um, right, building relationships, helping to build um, um, the so socio-emotional kind of uh, supports necessary in classes with educators, right, with families and caregivers, that is crucial work because they, students only learn the work in context of their, their lives and their, their, their emotional lives, right? And so I think to the extent that we can lean out what we do and deepen it, um, we're going to be in a much better place. Love that. Love that. Um, we actually have a question from one of AU's own master students in the School of Education. Um, and the question is, can you please share any restorative justice educational resources? And I apologize, they're actually in the School of International Service. 
they um, have experience in high school and professional education. And they want to know if you can share any additional restorative justice educational resources for educators or learners, whether books, programs, online, any that you can think of offline. Um, anyone who is actually um, in the chat room, if you have some that you'd like to share, please drop that in the chat as well. Um, do you have any that you all would like to share? I'm literally grabbing from my bookshelf here. This is a new <laughs> book, Colorizing Restorative Justice, um, okay. which I'll drop in the chat. I think that's an incredible one. And there's some sort of classic, the little book of restorative justice. There's, there's some classic ones, but there's um, Restorative Empowerment for Youth is a really powerful network of, of young folks um, who are really leading restorative justice work um, in schools around the country. So that's another network um, that folks could, could um, look towards. Wonderful. And there are some people, I, I, the Marshall Brennan Center that's in the Washington College of Law, um, they're doing some exciting work in DC schools that's related to restorative justice. It really is, um, you know, teaching kids to have their own voice around issues around justice. But I would even look at their website um, and they might have resources there. Some great people over there. Wonderful. Um, we have another question. I am working on a team that is trying to revamp our teacher education curriculum to be more anti-racist. What first steps do you suggest we take? Does AU have any examples of integrating this work into teacher education curriculum? There you go, I, I, Dr. No, Hope. I am Hope. just, I am so excited about that question. <laughs> yay, yay, yay. I'm glad someone asked because I was going to try to fit this in. Um, we have some extraordinary folks in the School of Ed, uh, Dr. Tracy Dennis um, and Dr. Jo Joshua Shusky, who's a postdoc who came to us from uh, University of Southern California. But anyway, they're working on a grant funded through the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on um, creating an anti-racist uh, teacher preparation curriculum, which they're, you know, um, fine tuning it now um, and we hope later this year in the fall to um, be testing it um, and actually using it um, in some of our courses um, and getting feedback and find, then fine tuning it some more. We hope to um, be able to share it um, in, the, in the spring. That's the plan. Um, but Tracy Dennis and Joshua Shusky and myself have been working along with um, some of our colleagues around the country Travis Bristol and others, um, to and Bettina Love, to really think about how should we be training teachers to be anti-racist. So I don't know about you, but as when I was trained to be a teacher, I didn't get any of this. Um, and it was, a you know, my training protocol was very um, racist and centered on whiteness. Um, and so I was unprepared to do some of the work um, that I ended up doing. And we've had to, I've had to train myself in some ways. Um, and I know others share the same experience. So we're really excited about this work. It's also, you know, with all of the abolitionist teaching protocols, also culturally relevant, the work of Gloria Ladson Billings and others, we haven't forgotten their tremendous work. It's embedded in what we're doing. We're adding the anti-racist piece because it's about the active stance of pushing back against racist policies and practices and structures. And we're bringing all of that together. So I'm, I'm excited that, you know, keep up with us, um, follow our website, follow, you know, us on social media. Um, and then when we actually launch, I would love for the folks on this call to be the first to take a look at it. And um, we hope to have webinars um, and hopefully one day face-to-face -face, um, meetings yes. around the curriculum. So that's, it's really exciting work. And um, I think that's the next action step, right? Is to take this right. and actually think about training educators um, in this space. Yes, Dr. Taylor, anything you wanna add? Mm, I think that was awesome. Um, I would just add, you know, again, there's a couple of awesome networks that are out there. You know, Bettina Love just launched the Abolitionist Teaching Network, um, which is another kind of amazing resource, um, you know, for, for folks. Oh my gosh, and the, there are a group of teachers in Massachusetts that just started um, a book club um, related to um, Bettina Love's book, but now they have a national anti-racist educator uh, conference that just finished where 
was uh, groups of teachers, thousands of teachers internationally that are coming together to talk about anti-racist practices. So um, it truly is a movement and it's, it's, it's so exciting. Um, yeah. And to see teacher educators and educators that are doing the training participate, yes. it's, it's really wonderful. And for educators who, um, who are not members of the First Book Network, please, please join because First Book also has a wonderful educator network um, and that focuses really heavily on uplifting educators who are serving children in need. And so again, yes, there are so many different networks um, to, to have educators engage and not, again, not feel like they're isolated in doing this work. Um, of course, time is flying. And so I would love um, to hear some final thoughts from both of you. Um, happy to start with you, Dr. Taylor. Oh, gosh, final thoughts. Um, <laughs> I think the final thought I'll leave folks with is um, keep going, right? Keep going. Remember, this is a struggle. Um, and remember that we ha this, this moment is an opportunity to move change, but this work is going to be here. And so sustain yourself, sustain others, um, and keep at it and, and use this opportunity to, um, to really start to drive change. But remember that um, the road is long and, and it requires all of us. So I'll, I'll stop there. All right. Dr. Hope McCoy? Um, just ditto um, to everything Amanda just said. Um, just want to say that, you know, one of my deepest fears is that, you know, we're talking about this now and then it disappears later. Um, so it goes back to what Amanda said. Let's just keep going. Um, stay connected. Let's create a large community of folks who are committed and passionate about this work. And we just keep it going. Even after folks stop talking about it, we're still doing it. Um, that's really important. One thing that I'm also really interested that's related to this um, conversation that I think folks should just start reading more about is internet intersectionality, I think is a critical piece of this work. You know, multiple sources of oppression are working in our classrooms. It's not just about being black or brown. Um, there's so many, um, as I say, multiple oppressions that students are yeah. facing. And so, you know, you know, for Kimberly Crenshaw's work around intersectionality, um, she's a legal scholar, but it, everything she writes about has everything to do with what we're talking about in classrooms. Um, so there's just this multitude of literature and um, people have done deep thinking about a lot of these um, concepts. So continue to read, continue to build your knowledge and self-interrogate and think about how it can be applied um, in your classrooms and in your learning environments. So. Um, I'm also, you know, Christine, I have no problems with you sharing my email if people want to get in touch or follow me I'm on Twitter. Um, it's fine. I'm learning how to social media, how to make you <laughs> social media. I really am. So, um, but yes, please keep in touch. I love to hear from folks. Thank you both so much. And thank you, I guess, for doing us the honor of closing out our first Empowering Educators convening on such a positive note. Thank you both so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> wow, I cannot believe um, that the day went by so quickly. Um, I want to thank Pizza Hut and First Book for making today possible. Thank you so much so much. And I want to thank you all for joining us for today's convening. Um, a special thank you to our ASL interpreters. Thank you so much. And please visit First Book to access the Empowering Educators Guidebook. And of course, bookmark the page to access more forthcoming resources. I hope you all found today's convening to be helpful, inspiring and encouraging as you continue the important work of teaching humanity to the next generation. May you feel empowered and know that I and so many others stand with you in solidarity as you begin this unprecedented school year. Thank you for your time and more importantly, thank you for your service. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.